Go live. Huh. Hello. Hello, everyone. Okay, I'm going to start this off quite simply because 96831, you've already started off on it. Um, you're presuming something. You are going, yes, what's going to happen is they have to have a big battle. Wait a second. You're presuming they have to have a big battle. You're presuming that's what both sides want. And unfortunately, yuck. There is actually dirt in this glass. Ah, oh, well, that's annoying. I'm presuming that's come from a poodle putting its paws all over the place. Ah, oh, well, iron brew it will be. Um, and, yeah, nice this way, A, eh? you might want to... I'm very appreciative you're very keen on these things, but you are, um... You're A, jumping along the way ahead, and B you are presuming some sort of battle which probably wouldn't take place. And, yeah. Hello, Jack Ray. Hello, John Shea. Hello, Calvin Gasberg. Hello, George Nevin Newman. Hello, Peter Dawson. Hello, Michael Cooch. Hello, John Luke. Hello... <sighs> Uh, how I was asking, hello, Glenn Stewart, hello, Peter Dawson, hello, it was for done. Night 6 one at this rate with you, the amount of spam you're putting in the chat, I am going to mute you just so people can get word in edgeways. Um, Bijon, the hello, hello, Master Dostal, hello, Nyaku4472, hello, Stephen Richards, and hello, Karl Gasberg. Hello, everyone. Basically, I've got the Carl Gunsberg. I have. Hello, new. Hello, Felix B, Joss Funk, and hello, Malaga, Rolling Cash. Hello, everyone. Hello, Dan Freeman. Yeah. Hi, Caramba. Now, hello everyone. Welcome to If Jenny Singto 1939 Singtao Incident Leads to War, How Does RN Carrier Force Fare Against the IGN? Well, before you can get to that, you have to think about what actually happens. This is the point which I'm going to be making a lot in this. This is the trouble. What if scenario? If you want to start off a if this question was, take the 1939, 1939 RN carrier force, 1939 Japanese carrier force, and stick them in the middle of the ocean and yell, fight, then Knight 6831 would have a lot of points with the points he's making, because he is charging through, going for all the stats of the Japanese aircraft, and certainly if you did it in daylight... It would be one way. If you did it at night time, it would be the other way. It's one of those strange things. If you did it in daylight, then the Japanese would win hands down. If you do it at night time, um, it, they're in within range that both sides know exactly where the other is, then probably the British win, because the British actually have the aircraft which are capable of flying and operating at night. And the air crews who are trained for it and doctrined for it. Um, so, you know, that's the scenarios you're dealing with. However, that's not the question. The question is not, do a simple box analysis of this for, this, tar, this carrier group, sets of the carrier group formations versus that carrier group formations and have them fight. It's, if the January 1939 Singtown leads to war, how does the RN carrier force fare against the IGN? Well, how it fares is going to depend upon how it's used. And how it's used is going to depend upon the scenario which ensues. And, yeah, as H. Donners pointed out, that is 
you're sorry, you know, you've made sure to respond out, it's not a fan of top trumps in every war. Well, I'm not a fan of top trumps in any warfare because top trumps doesn't tell you the truth. As Ferdinand has given an example of, swordfish never does anything because in top trumps it loses to everything. But in reality, we know it's actually quite successful. And we know it's one of the most successful aircraft of all of World War II. Why? Because it's fundamentally very reliable, easy to build, easy to maintain, and you can use it in every scenario. But these are not things... Easy to maintain does not come up as a top trumps. I don't know why, because it should do, but it doesn't. Honestly, if you were talking about aircraft easiest to maintain, I'm fairly sure the aircraft, which you can literally sew together using wrens, uh, using um, the wires are taken out of out of uh, wren braziers, is probably pretty high up there. Hello, Jacob. So, that's the point. Night 6831, please note, I am saying you are right if what we were doing is literally sticking the two fleets in the middle of the sea, telling them to fight each other in the middle of the day. They win. The Japanese win. Because of all the stats you're quoting. However, that is not the question. <laughs> if it was the question, I wouldn't be bothering to do it. It would never have made it through the criteria to be voted on because it's just... Yeah, Japan wins. Middle of the day, middle of the ocean. Yeah, two fleets in there. Japan's naval aviation wins because they're the better. They are the better aircraft. But that's not the question. Sport would be boring if it works like top trumps. Everything would be boring if it worked like top trumps. Shameless book plug. If you want to learn more about uh, the Royal Navy strategy in terms of destroyers, etc. In there. So, before we start, here is some background which is important to remember. For starters, the Tsingtao incident happens on the 30th of January 1939. Nice, everyone. Yes, but the trouble is, you've now said that point. Please note. And the reason I bring it up is you said it about a few dozen times in the chat and you've commented on other videos with that point. The point's been made, but that's not the discussion this video is about. And I'm not not wanting you to chat or be part of it, but I just want you to think about the question we're having, not a discussion which we're not having. As I've said, you are right if we were talking about that sandbox scenario, but we're not. Which is why I'm doing this. Now, as Stan Freeman is pointing out, and there is an entire book, if you want to understand just how much the British understand about the Japanese capabilities and just how much they do know about them, this is a great book to read. Andrew Boyd's British Naval Intelligence through the 20th century. The trouble for the British is the way World War II works out. The British are prepared for a war plan for fighting Japan. And they even have a war plan for fighting Italy. And they also have a war plan for fighting Germany. The war plan they don't have, really, is to start off with war against Germany, then Italy, and then Japan or Japan, Italy, or all three, because they've never been given the funding or the support necessary to fight that kind of war. So that's the problem. You can't plan for a war you can't fund. You can hope, you can prepare as best you can, but you can't do it. Hello, Amelia. So for starters, we're dealing with the 30th of January, 1939. So we're beginning, dealing with the beginning of 1939. Okay, because that's when Tsingtao happens. Japan didn't sign the Tripartite Pact till the 27th of September 1940. So there is no legitimate reason for Germany and Italy to declare war immediately. In fact, there's no legitimate reason for them to be part of this. Necessarily on Japan's side. They could stay neutral, they could stay part, or they could join the, uh, they, uh, they could join all sorts of things. And as the legitimate report pointed out, no French support. There is at this point no war in Europe. Okay. No war in Europe, which also means Japan doesn't have any of the bases it acquires from the French thanks to German coercion. So they have no Vietnam, no Laos, none of those. I hope it's not too early in asking, but I'm going to assume no American intervention in the situation. Um, basically, I'm going to discuss both scenarios. The idea of American intervention and not American non-intervention. 
and I'm going to talk about that. But in the basics I'm going to set up, I'm not presuming on American intervention, but let's be honest, the likelihood is that Americans would come, in, come involved, because, as I've said before, the, uh, them, in any scenario where Britain or America ends up in a war with Japan, the other one has to join in for risk of lose, impairing their own position in the Far East. So if America ended up fighting Japan, Britain would have to join on the American side. And if Britain ends up war against Japan, America would have to join. Just a function of real politics. Hello, some video photographer. How are you doing? So, remember also, neither side is prepared for this. They'll be going with what is available. It's January 1939. So it's not like what the Japanese launched in December 1941. When they've had months to prepare, they've been planning, they've got all sorts of phase operations, all sorts of forces prepared. They have literally just got what's ready. But also remember... The Export Control Act doesn't historically pass till the July 26th, 1940. So Japan's economy is in a marginally better state. But it's also, therefore, more vulnerable to economic coercion. Okay? Japanese Prime Minister at this time is called Hiranuma Kishiro. And Hiranuma Kishiro is not a bad guy, not a nice guy. He is the Prime Minister at this time. He is definitely right-wing uh, Japanese politician. The Kido Batai, or the Dashi Koko Kantai, is not formed till April 1941. The Kido Batai is, of course, what we tend to call it, but it's also known as the First Air Fleet. Um, so, while Sori is commissioned in December 1937, Hiryu isn't commissioned uh, isn't until July 1939, while Shikaku isn't even launched till June 1939, and Zukaku in November 1939. And you can't magically make ships appear. And you can't, as we all know, commissioning a carrier does not mean a carrier is ready to go to war. It means a carrier is available for war. It means a carrier has, uh, it still needs to be worked up. Its crews still need to be trained. So that is the problem. It's not, how do I put this politely, perfect, re uh, perfectly ready. I'd also say, and I'm just going to give you a heads up now. My sister burnt her dinner this evening, so um, I have just ordered her some food. I've ordered a snack for myself, but I've ordered her her dinner because she burnt it. I, I already fed me and mum earlier today. So there will be a small bit of a takeaway arriving in a bit, but that's just an excuse which me and my mum arranged so that I could buy her her dinner because she burned it. That's why I was a little late at starting, sorting that out. Uh, Yamato and Mushashi are not launched till August and November 1940. Shinano isn't even laid down till May 1940, so don't expect them to be a factor. Um, Min uh, Mitsumasa Yonai is Minister of the Navy. Yes! The smartest admiral the Japanese had is Minister of the Navy. This is a good thing. However, his deputy minister is Izoko, uh, Izoroku Yamato, Yamamoto. Um, Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Fleet at this point is Zengo Yoshida, who is not a Yamamoto. So, you have that problem. Yeah, my sister's cooking is getting better, but she burnt her dinner this evening. Um, British, uh, as for the British, our Prime Minister, of course, is Neville Chamberlain. Illustrious, formidable, and victorious aren't launched till April, August, and September 1939. Mm-hmm. Renown was historically not recommissioned until the 20th of August 1939, so far ships immediately available are Hood and Repulse in their ninth, in their unvarnished forms. Uh, King George V and Prince of Wales are launched in February and May 1939, so they are a long way from being commissioned. And Queen Elizabeth is going through refit. Valiant is only recommissioned from refit in November 1939, so Warspite is the only upgraded vessel of her class available. Meaning the capital ships are mostly as modernised in the late 1920s, early 1930s. Royal Oak, it becomes even more important. As one of only two upgraded battleships. Now, 12 of 16 tribal class destroyers are in commission. Woohoo! Also, 12 T-class submarines are in commission. Admiral Cunningham has yet to be appointed Commander-in-Chief Mediterranean Fleet. In fact, at this point, was deputising for Admiral Blackhouse, who's the sixth first sea lord, on the Committee of Imperial Defence and Admiralty Board. Not a salad. 
no. She was making... I think she was trying to make sweet and sour chicken. I know I've ordered her... I ordered her something nice from a grill place. Maybe Royal Oak can find her own. So, the point is... Uh, yeah, and th this is the problem for the Japanese at this point. Because, especially if they go to war in January 1939, they are the only game in town. The varsity of the Royal Navy will be sent out to fight them. So, when you start thinking about it, the, tri uh, the tribal class destroyers. In the middle of 1939 is when, historically, they get trans... Well, uh, they've got Creswell in charge of them, but Vian's in charge of a destroyer flotilla with the Mediterranean fleet at this point. Nell rods are available, yes. Um, but I thought I, you know, you can presume nell rods. It's like presuming with the ja uh, the Japanese battleships. The reason the Japanese battleships don't get more upgrading and more enhancement than they do is because all the stuff is going into Yamato and Mushashi. Speaking of which, I'm going to be responding to a comment on that. So we've got this as the background. This is what some of the background information is going on. Next level background. Actual strengths of naval air arms in the first six months of 1939 is not far off. I don't think Hosho and Argus will be much of a factor in this. I don't think either of them are going to be in there, so I think they basically cancel each other out. So you've got Ark Royal, Courageous, Glorious, Furious, Eagle and Hermes. Akagi, Kaga, Ryujo, Soryu and Hiryu. Now, we know... Some of these carriers, I can't think which one, mm -hmm, have issues with stability. Have a lot of issues with stability. So I think in practice, Ryuji and Hosho from the Japanese are probably not going to be taking part much in any early operations. If they're called up. I think it's going to be Akagi, Kaga, Soryu and Hiryu. Uh, well, Akagi, Kaga, Soryu, and Hiryu will come involved as it goes on. And I think it will have a chance to be involved. I don't think this will be a quick war. From the Allied side, from the British side, we have Ark Royal, Courageous, Glorious, Furious, Eagle, Hermes. Again, I think Eagle and Hermes probably get left with the, Atlanta, with the home fleet and the Mediterranean fleet. Because they still need some carriers with them. So I think you're looking at a Far East deployment of Ark Royal, Courageous, Glorious, and Furious. Um, Hermes technically is at the China Station. So it might well she might well be left there. But Eagle and Argus will be left with the Mediterranean and the Home Fleet. Her, where Hermes goes, well, that depends if Hermes survives the first initial fighting. But yeah, probably forms up. And again, remember the Royal Navy practiced with um, the Royal Navy did practice quite a lot of multi-carrier tactics in the interwar period. So this is the scenario they'd been looking forward to. They'd been looking for. Sorry, Jacob. Yeah, I do realize that now. Looking at, I put in a note about historically commissioned July, and then I put dot 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 sixty four. Uh, I should have just I, I should have put some other detail some other method rather than the dots. I left the dots there. I do apologize. So Arc Royal, Courageous, Glorious, Furious, and Hermes are your maximum of force. Arc Royal, Courageous, Glorious, and Furious are your logical force. And they'd be sent out, and they would probably be used as a combined force. It probably would be a nicest way. For the British and the Japanese, they probably would be combining their carriers up into one group, one battle group. Uh, for both sides, that makes sense. So you probably have the Rear Admiral aircraft carriers of the Mediterranean Fleet would come out. Now, the Rear Admiral aircraft carriers of the Mediterranean Fleet, and there is a reason I picked him. Um, because he is probably the most capable of the options. You're probably looking at Lumley Lister, who, well, he'd been made aide-de-camp to the king in 1939, 
and he's technically rear admiral in charge of of dockyard Scarpa Flow, but he's probably who would be called to be rear admiral aircraft carriers in this scenario. So that would be the British formation heading out. Hard to scary. The point I'm trying to make is that in terms of overall air groups and aircraft, they're going to be fairly evenly matched in terms of numbers. However, we here have this, the Aki D3A, which is first flight January 1938, introduced into service in 1940. And here is the problem again we're going to get into. I don't think Japan can hurry into anything into production. And I will explain this why, but I do not think anything gets hurried in production in terms of capabilities. Because they have the, pro they have the industrial issues they already have. But... Lumley Lister was the rear admiral who was involved in the Taranto raid and was a carrier captain and a protege of Admiral Henderson. So he's one of the best. It's L-Y-S-T-E-R. Um, one of the, pretty much one of the best Royal Navy officers in naval aviation you had. Uh... Ends even goes on to be holding the post of fifth sea lord from 1941 to 42. Nothing it was also forced into production to begin with. Yeah, it's it's and also you have to remember when an aircraft is considered introduced into service, that's when the first unit gets equipment, not when the whole force is transferred over to them. So, it introduction 1940. So, its likely impact in this war is not much. Primary strike aircraft, therefore, we have, and I'm going to expand this. We have from the Royal Navy, the Fairy Swordfish and a Blackburn Skewer. Yes, there is the Fairy Albacore coming, but again, that's not due until 1940. Um, we have the Aki D1A and the Yokosuka B4Y as the primary aircraft in service, the Nakajima B5N, which is the aircraft which Knight 6A31 is very impressed with, rightfully so. It does keep coming on and comes, comes on quite well, but it is literally just being introduced into service. And it is literally just being introduced into service in 1939. And in fact, it's not introduced in January 1939. It starts introduction probably in about April, May, which is going to present a problem, because if your carriers are operating away from home, they have to return home to change aircraft over. You also have to change up pilots and retrain on new aircraft, so then you've got to take good care of life. So it all depends on what's going on, how quickly you can do that. The RN does not have a magic teleport button to move the home fleet to Singapore. Uh, Skewer was introduced into service in 19, end of 1938, and it was in squadron service in 1939. But you'll notice that I've only listed in squadron service on the Ark Royal, because that's the only carrier it's actually available on in January 1939. Michael Cooch. Hence, very clear. And, and nice way, I don't quite have a squadron breakdown for the Imperial Japanese Navy in 1939, not one I will reliably quote on. But I do, thanks to my own PhD research, have one which I'm fairly reliable, rely, happy to rely on, broadly speaking, for the Royal Navy in January 1939. And you'll notice I have got Fairy Skewer, da 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 da, and Glorious also has some skewers and rocks. There is a dispute over how many she has versus how many Gloucester Gladiators, but you know. When did radar, air, airborne radar get fitted to Sawfish? Um, late, uh, we're talking 1940-ish. They are developing it, and again, this is something it's worth our remembering. The Royal Navy is fielding radar on its ships at this point.
I assume. So an airdrome would not have enough coats. Didn't consider that. Yeah, that's the thing. You can have a wonderful aircraft, but it's how many do you have at the point we're talking about? Because again, for the Royal Navy, and we'll be getting into these very talking about these aircrafts. These are sort of the aircraft you're dealing with, and. One of the things you notice is very quickly is that, honestly, the Swordfish in January 1939 is not going to be the only biplane doing strike aircraft work. It's not going to be alone. Because, look, to the two primary Japanese aircraft for their strike, for their dive bomber is the top one. This is their torpedo, a primary torpedo bomber, are also biplanes. They're still good, but they're biplanes. And you can't click your fingers and just get aircraft and ships ready. Uh, Pete Dawson, I think the Mark III, the Mark III have a built-in radar, and they're in, well, not built-in radar, but they get in 43, but they do start having airborne radar earlier than that, in that they have a sort of pod one they attach on, from memory. But it's how many aircraft get fitted with it, and whether it's more than experimental is what's going there through my head now, wondering about that one. I'd have to check that one up. And then there's the Ferry Abercorp. First flight, December 1938, introduction to service roughly early 1940. And again, here is, there is a point that I'm going to be making through this, okay? There is going to be an impact of the war on development of things. So, for the British, it might seem acceleration. For the Japan and Japanese, it might seem a de and there might be a deceleration in introduction slash acceleration of things. It might change things. You can click your fingers while you throw hundreds of thousands of monies at the problem and get your aircraft. Yeah, and the thing is, there are going to be issues going on. John, look, how will the IJN react to Rodney moving like a b oh, hell at them? If Rodney is moving like he a Rodney can move, then there is a problem for everyone in trying to catch up. The RN did have the night beacon system in service. So, yes, the RN does have the beacon for their night operations in service by this point in 1939. The Royal Navy has radar and beacons. Um, at this point, I think uh, illustrious class are all being designed to have radar. They have plans for fitting radar to the other carriers in January 1939. Ark Royal is due to be getting it. It's the basic radar system and the beacon system, which they use at night. Uh, the beacon system, which is used, um, it's basically, it's the system which is guaranteeing rotation every 60 seconds. And it's a narrow beam. And where you pick up that beam, if you're watching on your watch and you see which second is, you know if you head down that direction, you will find the carrier. It's one of the very basic systems the Royal Navy develops for its night strike capability. So instead of an aircraft having to find its way back to a carrier in the dark, which is physically impossible, it has to find its way back into a basket. Mitsubishi A6M Zero. It's the gorgeous aircraft we all know and love. But its actual first flight was the 1st of April 1939, and its introduction to service is the 1st of July 1940. So that's a long way away from being available. Nice turn. So the Americans got lucky historically because when the Jai joined World War II, they had the deadly stuff in numbers. Pretty much. <laughs> that's the, the joy of life. Can the Japanese aircraft fight at distance? They can do long range in daytime. Oh, so if the road lies on the rotation being synced to time, if your watch is off, well, if your watch is off, you'll still probably get quite close. And as long as you can guide in that close, then you probably will find the light boys being dropped behind the carrier, which provide a sort of timed release because they go off after about 30 minutes. So if you're within 30 minutes movement of a carrier, you will find these boys which will guide you to the carrier. Sorry. Looks like my snack is being delivered. Hello. Could you take that and wash it? Because I don't want to draw it out or anything, but it's got dirt from Riley's paw in it. I think that's the right one. Yes, that's the right one. You sure? Yes, it's got dirt from Riley's paw in it. Sorry. Thank you. 
Let's see, what did I get myself? I have no idea what I got myself. I know what she got herself because I told her to get it, but you know. Ah, good, I've got a milkshake. Um, so, again, Marimax, uh, Fear of 5 9. Were those battery pad or time fuse layers? Uh, they were chemical reactions that would run out, the boys. So, uh, they had a uh, they had a fuse which would set them off, uh, which was a timed release from their release. So they would be pulled and that gave them about 60 seconds before they went off. And then when they hit the water, they would last for about 30 minutes. Let's see, the Tony Cruisers, um, I think Tone herself might be in service. She commissioned November 1938, but Chikuma doesn't commission till May 1939. Pretty much Primark, pretty much giant glow sticks, that's what the boys are. It is interesting the different night fighting technologies of the Japanese and the British, and I will be getting into that in this, because that does have a factor. Now, we go to the next one. So, the primary fighters. Well, for the Royal Navy, it's this absolutely atrocious thing called a turreted fighter, a.k.a. the Rock, which is absolutely terrible, or the Gloucester Gladiator. Now, there is a reason for this. And I will get into that. I, I might do a short some point about those boys and the chemical reaction which causes them. And um, the Mitsubishi A5M. Which is something which in history often gets ignored. But it's actually a fairly decent fighter aircraft. And it's a pretty cute aircraft as well. So, again, I would say that one's got the range. But there again, this one is actually a very good interceptor. And I base this on a very simple uh, metric. If we consider how well three city gladiators managed to defend Malta at a point in about 1940, uh, in the sort of mid-1940-ish, I do not want to discount a Sea Gladiator as an air defense fighter, especially not when it's fighter or when it's radar directed. I also don't think they will last that long in the role. I'm fairly certain the Royal Navy will be rapidly developing full miles or something else. But, and we know they rapidly develop full miles, and we actually know full miles are already under development, and we know when those come into service in 1940. But that's a full year away. So for the for this time, they could. Uh, yeah, I I have to say the dog fight between this and this, they'd be very very pretty. I mean, literally, if you if they were if you didn't think about the fact that they were shooting at each other and trying to kill each other, they would be incredibly pretty to watch, because you'd be seeing some really cool acrobatics going on. And some really interesting stuff. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I do not know. By the way, if you're under Glyn, you're t you're WhatsApping me while I'm live. Just distracting me. Now, there is also potential for change of emphasis, because you also have to remember, this would be a slightly different war. 
We discussed before the gull-winged Spitfire, the Type 2424 Seafire. I see you message me while I'm live. Going, why is Clint messaging me on here? I'm sort of there. Um, now, we all know, of course, that that sort of cut program is sort of... It, it stops being RAF interested in 1937. Add in an I-16 and we've got the most attractive dogfight ever. Agree, Pan Mike. Um, as, as the Spitfire variant, it uh, goes off in 1937. But... It keeps being worked at for the Royal Navy's version of the Spitfire, the Seafire. Now, one of the things you have to think about is in January 1939, historically, and mid uh, January to mid 1939, the RAF makes a very strong case that, especially with the legacy of the Spanish Civil War, etc., the emphasis needs to be on developing a fighter for the RAF, and therefore that. Supermarines idea and the Supermarines efforts cannot be split. They have to be focused on this land based fighter. Which you can understand logic of. You might not agree with it, but you can understand the logic of. However, if the Royal Navy is suddenly fighting a war in 1939 and they really need their air defense fighter to be upgraded because their air fighter air defense fighter is this or this, suddenly they have quite a strong case to make to go, we want this. So, yes, the Royal Navy could be also getting extra emphasis put into the Griffin and Sabre 2000 horsepower engines. So, gull winged Spitfire with 2000 horsepower engine. Anyone wants to imagine what kind of demon spawn that would be in the world? <laughs> Oh, goodness knows, grace of me. A nice six for one, there's going to be a handful of rocks out there at all. That's going to be it at the best. I doubt they get any kills. Honestly. I really do doubt it. But they might get some. Again, because... If you have... If you consider, again... The point about the rock is it's supposed to be really good at dealing with long-range bomber aircraft. Because what you do is you fly up to them, you meet them, and then you fly alongside them, raking them with the turret. So it might actually might be effective versus the Japanese to an extent. As for, I, when I say effective versus the Japanese, I think ja effective versus the Japanese army, uh, Japanese uh, army strikes more than Japanese navy strikes. In general time, did World War II carrier support ships have the same defensive and offensive priorities as their modern carrier battle group counterparts? Not really. They're a different. It's a different mix. The prototype had fixed landing gear. The planned version would apparently have had fold-up landing gear. And the reason it was to be a gullwing design was to take the stresses of carrier landing. If we consider the sea fires and the stresses that goes through their their body and their wings whenever they land on carriers. And the reality of that, because they use the Spitfire shape. Because that shape is not designed for the kind of landing which is a massively controlled crash that is landing on a carrier. You start to understand why the gullwing variant was just for the carriers. I think control for the IJN as this Gullwing Spike will be pushed to counter the zero. Yeah, it, it would, could be entering service just at the point at which the zero is entering service. So that means zero versus that. <laughs> Andrew Cox. If I recall, the rock could be outrun by most bombers. Yes, because the rock was actually slower than the dive bomber it, it was built on. And was there an increase in size of this alternate Spitfire? Seafire. Yes, it could carry more fuel, and if I remember correctly, it's slightly longer and a lot of he and a fair chunk heavier. I'm 
何を集めたねおおなんでアイバックラバーあっ !That'll be no, nice for later. バックラバー And something smelling. There was something smelling in here. I was going, what is. Oh! I've got a burger! That's nice. But honestly, all these aircraft, that's even a sort of an interesting one because, of course, you have to remember that's into service because the Royal Navy has a delay getting the. What it's supposed, what is supposed to be coming into service, into service. I was asking, but it would have fixed landing gear. Um, no, because the Gullwing aircraft wasn't to have fixed landing gear; it was to have fold-up landing gear. But the test bed aircraft, this is the test aircraft, which they designed to test the shape. Uh, nice different. It would need the same landing techniques as the Seafire had historically to an extent, but it would have a slightly higher pitch and higher propeller position when it landed. Um, I'd say more I'd be worried about the nose, and I think it's more like a Corsair landing than anything else. Um, here's the thing. They actually are ordering Brewster Buffaloes, not Wildcats. And the Wildcat in 1938 isn't that great. The Wildcat in 1938 is not that good. No worries, Lysiron. It's just the reason I was saying what I was saying was because I was trying to get away from, uh, make sure it was all sorted out before we got into it. So, we've done the background. Any questions on the background before we start into the incident and like your concurrence? Because. I'd say the most interesting thing here in all this is the fact that Isoroku Yamato is the deputy minister and Cunningham is not appointed to med trainer fleet. Enjoy, Glenn. I assume the Fairy Barracuda is not going to be held up if the war starts against the IGN. No. I'm Rymac. I haven't yet started out that with the initial clash because the, what's already in the theatre for the initial clash is literally some cruisers. I have been, It's all going to be coming into the theatre and it's all going to be meeting up at Singapore. I'm doing the back. I'm doing deep background at the moment. Discovery, is the weight of these different engines comparable? Um, power to weight wise, the 2000 horsepower engine is slightly more efficient than the 1000 horsepower engine. However, it does take time to develop. They're not just going to suddenly appear. Please note, the RN has a list of plans of attacks already written up. It Taranto style. This is the point I tried to make in the Taranto videos. The planning for the Taranto attacks was started work on and were worked on throughout the 1920s and 30s. The RN has plans for attacking everywhere. 
In fact, one of the conversations I heard about that someone tried to claim was that the Japanese actually got the plans for attacking Pearl Harbor from the British. Because this was a historian who really doesn't want to give Japan any credit at all. And I'm using historian in Luce's term here because they were writing a history book. And they wanted to give Japan no credit for Pearl Harbor at all. And they actually had to be dissuaded by the USN from writing that because it wasn't true. But there again, it was true. The British had plans for an a, 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 a carrier attack on Pearl Harbor because they had plans for an attack on every single harbor. Because that was the entire point of the Harbor Attack Committee and the whole, you know, the experience of, of World War One and Wilhelmshaven. They were never going to be caught in a scenario again where an enemy fleet could hide in harbor away from them. Oh gosh, I'm confused. The rock and the fan. What's the theory that they could sit off a bomber in the blind spot for the bomber's guns and attack with impunity? Yep. What more of those ships do the, uh, the Japanese have in 1959? Again, they've not modernised as much as they will do. Their modernisation programme really picks up in 1939. They've got a few modernised ships. Directory, our in the war period is basically Batman making plans to take down anyone who could, anyone should they decide to become an enemy. Pretty much. I'm fairly sure the R. I know Melanie sixteen forty is joking when they have plans for an attack on Scarpa, but I'm pretty sure the RN did have plans for an attack on Scarpa in case a portion of the Royal Navy turned rogue and decided to try and mutiny and hold out in Scarpa. So, what does Britain have in China? Well, it has the 5th Cruiser Squadron and the China Station, which are Birmingham, Dorsetshire, Kent, Cornwall and Suffolk, which goes home at, in January 1939 is starting to head home. Consider that. Suffolk is supposed to head home in January 1939. Now, the Singtown incident is pretty simple. And I've covered this in a number of videos, so I don't feel bad about saying, hmm. However, let me just check, because below me, in the description, there is supposed to be a link to a certain website. If there isn't, I will add it in now. If you want to go and read up about the Singtowns and, and what exactly happens, you can. But this is me basically saving time and not repeating in video again. What I've already said on a couple of occasions. Now, broadly speaking, we have British flagged merchant vessel is trading in China, but not paying customs duty to the Japanese who pretty much taken over the, the, the um, shoreline of, of China other than those areas controlled by Western powers. It goes out steaming, gets impounded by the Japanese Coast Guard in China, who are a function of the Japanese Army. Please note, function of the Japanese Army. Primark, you are, well, YouTube Live updates for descriptions during the streams. Sometimes, if you're lucky. Now... 
What happens is it gets taken into Tsingtao, which of course is Japanese territory. They took over from the Germans, who'd taken it from the Chinese. Because that's the traditional base of the, of the uh, Germans had for their East Asia squadron. Mm -hmm. Now, Japanese Navy disclaimed responsibility for arrest. HMS Birmingham gets sent in. And there are a lot of incidents during the evening. I've talked about them, how um, basically she arrives... They send people aboard to try and find out what's going on. They don't find out, and no one seems to know what's going on. So he sends a midshipman, uh, who becomes and later on an admiral of the fleet, Ashburton, um, aboard with a chief, a leading seaman, and some sailors. And they actually have a standoff with customs officers during that time. So that could be an incident which leads to war. They could end up with a fight. Um, he, Brind announces that he intends to lit sail in the company uh, with uh, Shanghai at 8 a.m. on the 30th of January. He tells them where he's going, he tells them what's happening, and so he leaves and he does that. And while he's going out, the Japanese Ashigaras, the, the three vessels of the class which are in there, of the Ashigara class, um, point their guns at her at HMS Belfast and HMS Belfast, not HMS Belfast, HMS Birmingham. Sorry, thinking about Belfast behind me. Still waiting to be completed for Sunday's video. Hopefully to be completed in, this, in Sunday's video. Um, I'm missing some pieces, but I'll explain that at some point. Um, and as they're literally sailing out, the guns are pointing at each other. And what Birmingham does is they point a turret at the... At the um, bridge of every single one of the Japanese cruisers and they point their fourth turret at the ashore command center of the Japanese Navy and so they sail out with their guns pointing out oh and by the way uh, the little HMS Folkestone if I remember correctly is it Folkestone let me just check yeah HMS Folkestone who's with them little Hastings class soup is also pointing her little four inch pop pop at the Japanese as well for what good that will do and um, they sail out and this is why it can be a very much a, a sort of potential um, source of war because of the reality of this point in these guns at each other now please note These incidents are not as unusual as they might sound. Today, that would sound pretty strange. But, um... In the 1930s, this is... One of possibly two dozen incidents like this with the Royal Navy and the Japanese Navy. And they're still friends. There's Britons are still making port visits to Japan, still being Bon Hami, and yet other times they're pointing guns at each other. There gives it makes the sound off the sea. No, this wasn't the sea. This was in port. You have to remember, these ships were within I think the closest one was sixty meters from uh, from Birmingham. So think of it. At 60 metres range, A, that's an 8-inch cruiser, so there is no chance. And B, that's a 6-inch cruiser, so that's no chance. There is actually, there is no armour. None of these ships have armour. None of them are getting out, okay, of here alive. If they fire at each other, there are going to be three sunk Japanese cruisers. There is going to be a sunk Royal Navy cruiser, and there will be war. That is what will happen, because they are at that close range. There are usually someone at this point, and when I'm giving these talks, they go, well, you know, she's got six-inch guns, they have armour, they're eight-inch, you know, it'll be an easy victory. I'll go, they are 60 metres range. If the shells arm before they actually impact each other, I will be surprised. It will literally be kinetic energy kills. But they will do so much frigging damage, it will destroy each other. None of these ships get out of here alive. 
It gives you, it gives you a point blank. Now that's some, yes, it is. Jacob, 60 meters down, the muzzle blast will scrape the paint off the target. Yep. Minus 60 volume. Shells are armed by setback. They will detonate even at that range. Yeah. Probably. Um, I have put a link to Captain Brind, who was the captain of um, HMS Birmingham, to his wiki page. So you can go and see pictures, a picture of him, and it's the only picture I can find of him, actually, in the description. So if you want to go see what Brind looked like, because you're all making various comments about him, um, you can go and have a look at him as well. He, he, there's a picture of him when he was a rear admiral in the desk in the Admiralty. He was back in the Far East, um, in Commander in Chief Far East, in uh, 1949 when Amethyst was involved in the Yangtze incident. And then he went on to become Commander in Chief, Allied Forces Northern Europe. Captain Brind uh, at this point, but became, of course, um, he was commander of the cruisers of the British Pacific Fleet in 1945. He is um, he is a consummate professional cruiser officer. He has um, no, absolutely no fear. And he will not back down. And you have to remember, the British can't afford to back down. Because if they back down to the Japanese, then they lose their status. It's, you know, it's good. They prefer to lose, their sh uh, lose a ship than lose their status. Because one will do them less damage as a nation. They can replace a cruiser. They can't replace their status. And the cruiser officers understand this. And they operate on that scenario. Ron Cash, wouldn't the more advanced radar give uh, Birmingham an advantage? At 60 meters, there is no advantage. They, it's not a case of even... You don't even need visual range. It's literally point. That direction is where the ship is. Why? How do you know, sir? I can see it out the window of my turret. Also, you say pop, pop, but those quick four uh, hiring four inch shells... Well, the 40 millimeter, the the, the, the pom pom go, uh, shells will be going off as well. And believe it or not, they had the torpedoes, pom poms, everything, man, everything crude. The Yorks in 39 are not anywhere near here. I think one of them's in the, I think one's wandering around the South Atlantic, and one's in. I think it's in the Mediterranean. I'm not sure. Bore sight, yes. Definitely. You could probably peer down your gun and see the enemy ship.
So please do, actually, no, please do, if you want to go and click on that link below, you should have a link to Patrick Brind, and please go look at the man who is um, doing this as a captain. And that will that if that picture will make you understand why you should be very scared of Royal Navy captains in the 1920s and 30s, because no one looks like a nicer, more pleasant, kind individual than this. And then you realise he did this. And you go, oh, so you're a consummate professional who is prepared to do whatever's necessary to win. Okay, I will remember that next time I choose to try and d dice with you. Turrets have windows, incredible technology. No, the turrets still have view sights and tend to have, you know, hatches and things you can peer out of. Don't worry, Roland. John Luke, what are the chances one of those ships' magazines would detonate? I'd say what are the chances one of those ships' magazines don't de detonate? Now, that's probably uh, a smaller number. Mm hmm. Uh, let's see. Uh, Nature of the Dunn, I've looked at the photo. I know it sounds odd, but he looks like the original astronaut types. Yeah, not a man I want to cross. Yes. Consumer professional, very good at his job. So, the thing is, what is the likely flashpoint? And I've been asked this before, and we've done a Sing Tao uh, video before, but we didn't talk really about the whole what the naval aviation would be part of it doing. And so that's why I'm doing this again. But as I said before last time, I think the likely flashpoint is not in the harbour. I think the likely flashpoint is when the army complains up the chain of command that the Navy's let them go. And then they're sent after them. I also think that's more likely from the Japanese perspective, because let's be honest, fighting out at harbour, you would lose all three cruisers. Sending those three cruisers... And some destroyers to hunt down the convoy at sea heading to Shanghai. You have a chance of A, catching them up because there's only so fast that the SS Vincent de Paul can do. Probably a maximum of 12, 14 knots at best. More likely 11. And... Well... You're likely... Then you can pick the engagement range and you can make it suit your 8-inch guns. Now, there is a problem for that. You likely win. But, again, HBS Birmingham with Brind under its, at, at its helm is not going to go down easy. You are not going to take a town class cruiser down easy. She is going to duck. She is going to weave. She's going to try and get close. She's going to be blasting off her six inch guns as much as she can. And she's trying to try and get into torpedo range. So, yes, you'll probably sink her. But you probably will lose a ship as well. I've, again, done the odds, and the odds... I did some work on um, UAD. And as a rule, I managed to get usually one of the Japanese ships before I got annihilated. And I did get annihilated. So please note, I'm not saying, therefore, that the British are amazing or anything like that. But I'm basing on Birmingham having a veteran crew, which she did having a veteran captain, which he did, and I let the AI run it. So it's not me running it, it's the AI running it. And as a rule, they get it. And even when I run it, as a rule, I got one before I got killed. So, yes. I guess the Japanese do have the Long Lance Torpedo. And that's sort of one of the scenarios where they go, well, this, this surely that would happen. But the British, as a standard, do the whole um, zigzagging thing. Which has a really big impact on long-range effectiveness of torpedo launches. So, if your enemy is proceeding in a straight line, you can do a long-range torpedo launch, and it is devastating. If your enemy is zigzagging, it makes it harder to chart out where they're going to be. That's the point of the zigzag. Not the fact, and it's, and it's not the zigzag that throws it off. It's the zigzag which makes it harder to calculate where they're going to be at any point, because... They won't zig and zag exactly at the same time, exactly, uh, repeatedly. They won't do it in a continuous fashion. They, there is going to be some randomness there, zigging and zagging. 
which will throw off where your torpedoes can be aimed at, which means you usually have to get closer to fire your torpedoes. That's the problem. And again, this is something I remember getting into because we've been talking about the long lance torpedo, etc. before. The USN, several officers are smart and do zigzag. And there is a good example of that battle with oh, at Honolulu basically escapes because she does. She breaks out a line and starts zigzagging and accelerating away like mad. And the other American cruisers proceeding in a line all get bushwhacked by various stages of the torpedo. And... This does, to an extent, has given the Long Lance a very, you know, oh, it's a long-range kill super weapon. And it is really very, very good if your enemy is presuming you are dumb. Because, basically, it, the reason the British zigzag is because the British... It, it, we've been without knowledge of Long Lance. The British zigzag, based on the idea of submarines. It's basically another legacy of World War One. It's one of the reasons, again, we've, I've been discussing this recently with someone, and I was doing a response on a comment response video. Um, this was a long discussion about, you know, cruisers being fitted with ASDIC, and um, uh, hydrophones to listen for torpedoes. For other navies, and I mean, in the US doesn't have necessarily a standard of fitting it, because... They don't. They view the weight and the limitation on the displacement limitation. It's more important to fit something else. For the British, with Chrissy, Abaker, and Hogue in their experience, all their cruisers get fitted with something. Some of them even have ASDIC, and all their cruisers and all their ships zigzag because of their losses in World War One to submarines. So even one of the interesting things is even when they are racing back, they are to an extent zigzagging, and it is in daylight. So they're heading back to Shanghai. And if they saw the Japanese cruisers coming up, they would probably start to zigzag more obviously. Did we have a carry on the Crimea station? We did. It was Hermes. She's sitting at this point down in Shanghai. I think with a, with four ship magazine explosion, the port will not even be usable due to extent. Oh yeah, Singtao itself would have blown sky high. So, this is the other escort which they have with them. Now, please note there is also one other factor which I want to point out. Theoretically, they're supposed to do 20 knots. However, however, the Raw Navy make it Uh, they on the twenty eighth of Jan uh, from the twenty eighth of January, they arrive in Singtown the thirtieth of January, and they were in th in Manila in the Philippines. So, you know, basically, Folkestone makes it along with Birmingham from Manila to Singtown in less than a day. Of steaming. In other words, considering the uh, prevailing currents and winds, um, she would have had to be capable of going a lot faster than 20 knots. But if you read up the official classification for a Hastings class sloop, and remember, sloops are supposed to be limited by design to a maximum speed or oh, design speed of 20 knots. Hastings class sloops are supposed to be capable of 16 knots maximum. That's what the Royal Navy officially listed them as being capable of. So, if you want to do the maths, they leave Manila at after midday, and they arrive by midday on the 29th. They leave midday at half to midday on the 28th, and they arrive in uh, arrive at Singtao on the uh, midday on the 29th. And, um, 
it's noted that when they cruise into visual range, they proceed in an unhurried fashion into Singtao Harbour. So as from their arrival in visible range of Singtao, they are proceeding in an unhurried fashion. So make that no more than 12, 14 knots. The water uh, the Hastings class are 1,045 tons, 250 foot, uh, 50 foot in length, that's 76 metres. 34 foot 1 inches in beam, that's 10.39 metres. And a draft of 12 foot 6 inches or 3.81 metres. They have geared steam turbines, two shafts and 2,000 shaft horsepower, theoretically. Two 4 inch guns and uh, in single mounts and uh, 4.5 inch uh, AA guns in a quadruple mount. John Shane, read the, uh, read, just read this thing to article. Very informative. Thank you. Plus, uh, New Orleans and uh, New Orleans and Astoria, uh, New Orleans and Astoria aren't the only ships to have a debate on who should be the leech of the class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, incidents happened. British cruiser, British merchant ship, and British sloop horrifically sunk by Japanese aggression. Goes round the world. Horrendous Japanese aggression. Japanese aggression. Japanese aggression. That's all you'd be hearing. Every single news flash going around the world. Ah, oh, you can imagine Sun, Daily Mail, every tabloid around the world. Japanese horrific aggression. Japanese atrocity. Japanese. Japanese. All that stuff. Andrew Cox. Focus on engineering. I'm so late. Trust for the Rodney. Don't joke about that. Mmm, it's it's amazing. British sloop design is just amazing. <laughs> it's just, it, it's an amazing. I, I do wonder if perhaps they had governors fitted which could be removed. <laughs> uh, Jacob, don't turn 50 feet. That's a 21 knots max theoretical. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, and that, uh, uh, based on that engine power. But um, once you start working out the pace of likely advance, they were probably doing closer to. Um, <clears throat> let's put it this way closer to Rodney chasing Sean, uh, chasing Nisenau speeds than um, 16 knots. So, war aims. Well, Japan's war payments are actually quite easy. Get Britain and rest of the West, if possible, out of China. Secure position as a great power. Or just fitted for, but not with governors for the engines? Maybe, Dan. Maybe. Uh, Britain. Destruction of Japan as a threat. Think British war aims versus Germany. No navy, no ability to build a the navy. They honestly don't care about much else. If allies join, expected to expand to include Japan out of China. But Britain's honestly not as bothered about Japan getting out of China as other people would be. Britain would prefer Japan to stop being in China and stop causing troubles in China. But actually get forcing Japan out of China and having to send an army to do it is not what they're going to do. However, if they happen to ally with the Republic of China forces... Then, of course, getting the Japanese out of China will become quite likely. So, yeah, the IJM would have lost three heavy cruisers, which they wouldn't be able to replace quickly, if at all. No, they wouldn't be able to replace them at all. So, there is no point fighting that battle in Tsingtao. There is no point. 
anyone who anyone who comes back to me and goes, yeah, but they should have. It would. It, it only makes sense if they actually fire at them in Singtel. Is basically saying that there are <clears throat> several Japanese officers who are willingly going to commit suicide at that point in 1939, when they don't have to and they don't have orders to. I find aim number one is unrealistic. That's the Japanese war play, uh, war aim. If Russia, would there be an Indochina campaign? Possibly. But we'll get into that. It's unrealistic, but it is their war aim. Because you must remember, their primary war aim for going to war with America was to get America out of China. That was one of their primary war aims. Calm goes with, ignore the manual's warning, I wrote them. Scotty, he and season, them, them, you know, one. Yeah. Um, let's put it this way. I am, someday I'm going to produce a book about Royal Navy Sloops. I am slowly working on it. It's, it's my next big book. I've got four small books going on, but our next big book is going to be Sloops. And the main reason it's taking time to do it, and it's not going to be a quick production, is because of the sheer amount of yards I'm going to have, yard archives I'm going to have to visit to try and nail down exactly how they did certain things. Because I find details of when they are here in A and when they turn up in B, and then I look at their design speed, etc., and I'm going, um, there, is, there is no way you can get from A to B in that time, or that speed. Primark, instead of British, would the more political move mean to force the British to repel a boarding exchange so it can be claimed the British imperialistic aggression? The trouble is, if you're doing a boarding action on, and let's say if you did that in the harbour, it's a British flag merchant vessel, and it's you've been told there's a British naval crew on there, and very politically, the British naval crew kept saying, we are just, we are just following orders, Respond, uh, go and talk to our officers, go and talk to our senior officer aboard Birmingham. And it basically, you can consider that a vessel is currently in custody of Royal Navy ships. So, by that point, the ship had been taken over and was now considered British sovereign soil. So, it's, again, it would be Japanese imperialist aggression. It would be Japanese aggression. How about Dutch subs knocking around in 1939? There's a lot of them. And British subs knocking around 1939. So, now we're getting into the strategy discussion. Japanese versus British strategy. So, broadly speaking, the whole idea is actually very Greeks versus Romans. Why does uh, the Wikipedia not have a page on the Singtown Summit? Because there is literally nothing written about it, other than what I've written. So, there's the journal articles I've written about it. There is the uh, stuff I've written on the Global Maritime History site. Uh, but otherwise, people have mostly ignored it from history. There is a little bit of it in Ashburton's book himself, The Battle and the Breeze, uh, which is up there, which I have up there, which I have shown you all in his uh, things because it's his personal account of being it. But um, honestly, I found it reading in a town class book. I just found a Singtown in 1939, Birmingham was involved. And I went, what the frick happened? And then it took me... A good two years of hunting sources down to find out all the details about it. Jacob, if you don't trust the design speed, calculate the hull speed and then start comparing weights and engine power. Mm-hmm. I do that, but the figures I get for these ships once I start comparing their real engine power, once I go through the yard engines fitted in versus their design engine power, uh, theoretical design engine power, and when I go and, le and legend engine power, and then I look at their lengths, come to a very different thing than what they're listed. You should make it no, no. If the historian who writes the stuff starts making wiki pages, wiki pages on things, then you get into trouble. And I basically, once I get a book published with all the incidents and details in, then it's going to be, then someone else will probably make a wiki page on it and we'll be able to reference it. 
Um, Japan is that you destroy enough of the enemy in a single battle. You then negotiate peace from position of strength, which is actually a very Greek style method of warfare. And why I'm using Greek, because that's the traditional sort of lexicon. It's also quite an in traditional Eastern side of the idea of warfare. In the sort of the whole Japanese Eastern territories, it's a traditional methodology. Um, it's one of the interesting things in some of the areas around that. That is how you fought wars. You had a big battle. And the big battle, whoever won that, then you had the strong position in the negotiations afterwards. Britain's policy on war fighting is you keep fighting till the other side can't fight anymore. Then you pummel them some more to make sure of that. And then you tell them what the peace is going to be. Pramuk, have you ever actually contributed to Wikipedia or on someone else's book? Uh, I... Yes, a long time ago. But once I got to the point of start writing books, I had a conversation with a friend who had also had stopped, and he said that... So he basically said, look, Wikipedia is a good space for people who are becoming historians to go and flex their muscles. You have the opportunity to write books, you have the opportunity to publish articles, etc. You don't need to do the Wikipedia work. So leave that to other people to do so they can develop their skills because, like, you develop your skills. So I leave Wikipedia to the people who are developing their skills rather than jumping in myself. Which sounds sort of egotistical, but there's also is a sort of reasoning behind it. I presented this all in a conference paper years ago on Singtown. And I had the entire room and a couple of professors in the room going, Frigate me! What the... And when you start going, look, there's this incident, there's this incident, there's this incident, they're all pointing guns at each other. It suddenly there's a fair number of people who are going, we never understood that why the British were focusing on Japan, etc. so much. It seemed silly for the Royal Navy to be like, oh, they're pointing guns at each other. Oh, suddenly the Royal Navy's focusing on war with Japan versus war with Germany and Italy. It seems sensible because they're not actually pointing guns at each other with Germany and Italy. No. <laughs> They're still at the stage of guns not pointing at each other with Germany and Italy. With Japan, they're at the stage of, we have guns pointed at each other, and we have all the stations crewed. So, diplomatic Mahan way, yeah. So, let's get into some of the strategy discussions. Tekuko Kobu Kokuba Hoshin, that's Imperial Defense Policy, and Tekuko Yohei Koryo, Imperial Defense Doctrine. The Navy shall conduct operations aimed at annihilating the seaborne forces of the enemy insofar as possible by forestalling him and the army at gaining the advantage of holding the initiative by rapidly concentrating the required forces in the area before the enemy can do so. This is the core of Ch Japanese war fighting strategy. This paragraph appears in the introduction. In a 1907 version, a 1918 version, 1923 and 1936 version. It is... Interesting. Um, if you do want a good book which does actually cover quite a lot of what we've talked about. Although... Andy Boyd's Eastern Waters, 1935 42 one of the interesting things I found in it was not the Sing Tower incident, if I remember correctly. Um, it's got other events in it. Maybe this has Sing Tower incident. No. Doesn't even mention Sing Tao in the index. As a place. 
Um, looking at this for his other name, Kung Do. No. No. PQ. PPPB. Kung Dao. No. Not in there. And I know Andy, because I've talked to him about this, he said literally there's just so much I couldn't actually... It is one of those interesting books where he... To get it to the level that he could publish it. If you consider... For both these books, which Andrew Boyd did, which are the British Intelli Naval Intelligence in the first 20th century and Britain um, in Eastern Waters, 1935 to 1942... Um... Both these books, his exact expression is they contain roughly 20 to 25% of the research I actually did on the subject because I couldn't fit any more in, in the word limit. So, there are, though, some other doctrines which do get quite commonly talked about. When we start talking about Japanese doctrine, the Kantai Kessin comes up, and I've done already Pearl Harbor on the Kantai Kessin, I've done Kantai of the Philippine Sea in the Kantai Kessin, I've done Lots of discussions on the Kantai Kesson because it comes up so often, and I want to get it. I, I like to try and discuss why it isn't actually the be all and end all. Specifics of the Kantai Kesson achieve a local superiority of force, allows you to overwhelm your enemy to deliver a devastating blow onto them. Makes sense. It will normally achieve by a concentration of the total fleet force. So that's what you're looking for in, uh, in action for it to be decisive battle doctrine. It's gotta be that. And it's rooted to an extent in one interpretation of Mahan. So, we're looking for, is the significant portion of the, if you're looking for a Kantai Kessel Doctrine, is it against a significant portion of the enemy fleet? Is it a majority portion or even hold the Japanese fleet, or fleet operation? Mm, and all these things. So, if they are going, if they try to pursue a decisive battle against the British, they will have to bring down their whole fleet. Now, that's a problematic thing in this scenario, because if you consider it, Throughout the war, Japan had trouble operating their fleet as far uh, that far away from home. There is a reason why their battleships basically live at home in Japan, and it's not just defensive and waiting for this uh, cure, this Kantai Kessen. It's that they have the same issues of fuel. They have lack of fuel, and they have lack of tankers to refuel them, and fueling facilities to fuel them. So moving them around doesn't really come up. Um, you have Yugeki Zengen Sakusen, Inception Attrition Operations. Now, this is the overwhelming actual strategy for operations. This is what would happen prior to any decisive battle. And is honestly what you would have to perceive would be the guiding light of Japanese theoretical thinking before any war, at the beginning of any war. Um, it as I've put here, has become dogma by the late 1930s, entailed the following operations. First, at the start of hostilities, the and this is um, all from Yoshi Hirama, uh, basically it's all paraphrased from Yomi, uh, Yoshi Hirama, Japanese Naval Preparations for World War II, as published in the Naval War College Review, Spring 1991, Volume 44, Number 2, Page 64. And, mm, paraphrased, copied, uh, um, you know, I think it's paraphrased at all. I'm putting in quotation marks, so I'm just paraphrasing. Um, first, at the start of the hostilities, the Navy would destroy the US Asiatic fleet, and in cooperation with the Army, seize Luzon in the Philippines and Guam. These actions would eliminate American strangleholds in the Western Pacific. Hang on, that's plans for war against America. This is starting to sound like the Schlieffen Plan. We're going to. Russia is mobilizing, so we will invade Belgium to get to France. Second, submarines would proceed to the Eastern Pacific, where they would monitor the movements of the main American fleet. They would take the American fleet as forces set out westward and attack it repeatedly to diminish its strength. Third, naval aircraft based in the South Seas mandated islands, hereafter Micronesia, would attack the enemy once he came within range. Carrier-borne aircraft would further reduce his strength. Fourth, advanced body of cruiser destroyers supported by fast battleships, 
i.e. the Congos, would deal a major blow to American fleet in a night attack. This would occur once the enemy had reached the seas designated for the decisive battle, and would constitute the first phase of this battle. The second and the final phase would be a follow at daybreak, when the full weight of the main battle fleet would be thrown against the American fleet and annihilated. So, basically, the Japanese plan is to wait for you to come to them. Interesting. Won't the RN have the same fuel issues in the Pacific 1959? No, because they've already built the fuel for them. I can talk about this, but we have discussed this before in various things. The Royal Navy has spent the most of the interwar years building infrastructure. There are massive fuel stores in Singapore, in Malaya, at uh, Truk, and Ceylon, and in Australia. Massive, huge ones at Darwin. Huge stores with full of fuel. In fact, for the Japanese, it was the British fuel supplies at Singapore which kept a lot of their war in the Southeast Asia going. But we'll get into the British War Doctrine at a certain point. RN oil fuel like squirrels and nuts? Yep. Yogoki Sekelson or Ambush Shastri. Uh, this is a key doctrine. Now, this leads to something else. There is a book which is not published in the English language. And Primark, and Japan did not have the capability to destroy those wars. No. They didn't destroy the ones in Australia. They didn't. They, they captured the ones in Singapore and Truk. They were hardened stores. They are hardened. It requires, a, basically, one of the... Uh, they are... You have to have bombers in range as well. And you have to remember, again, Japan doesn't have, in this scenario, doesn't have in the China bases, doesn't have Philippines, doesn't have any of those yet. Now, there is an interesting book out there which does put this idea out. So, and it's not English language, but I do know where it is. And this is, was actually published not that long ago today by B.K. Jong. Yamoto's, this is on another video, weren't supposed to be deterrents though. They were intended to seem less powerful and capable than they really were. So an enemy force would see and send what they thought was an adequate battle force against them, only to end up being outmatched. To use your security analysis analogy, the point was less to deter robbers than to catch them in the act and get them arrested. And once everyone switched to using carriers of Pacific, battleships weren't effective deterrents anyways, because both the US and Japan were far more concerned with each other's carriers. Now... BK, I am sorry, but I'm going to historianize your uh, your point. So let's work backwards. The second paragraph doesn't count. The reason it doesn't count is because whilst as history moves on, it proves that aircraft carriers do come to the fore, they do not immediately make battleships extinct or worthless, and it does not act as a backwards reinterpretation of what that battleship was originally built for. So just because as the battleships building the world changes, or after this in this case, after battleships already come into service, the world has changed, doesn't mean its reasons for construction have changed. You cannot change the past because of changes in the future. Secondly, I know where this idea comes from. I know the book that says, oh, I haven't read it. I'm not going to name it because I haven't managed to find an English translation of it. And there's a very small problem with its logic. In that, if I want to build something that's intended to seem less powerful and capable than they really are, I do not then build something which busts the treaty limits. I do not then build something which is so much bigger and so much larger than anyone else's ships. I just don't. Because that's going to be obvious. I possibly build a 35, or something that's about 40,000 tons, that I can claim is 35,000 tons, and arm it with six... 18-inch guns in one triple in two triple turrets. I possibly do a kind of Nelson Rodney class, and then claim they're 16-inch guns. 
and do something like that. I do not build something which is so much bigger, so much larger. Because if I do that, I am obviously not making something which is going to be a secret and how much better it is than other ships. No one is going to look at something which is 60 odd thousand tons and think, you know what, you're not as good as my 35,000 ton ship. They're just not. They're just not. Um, I know there's that book out there, but I'm sorry. I haven't managed to find any of the translation on it, so I said I'm not going to name it because I haven't read exactly what I said. But a lot of people come at me with just variations on this. And it's just, it just doesn't work as logic. There's also a small problem because it's all based on the idea of Yogiki Sakusen being the, um, being the core strategy for that idea. I'm sorry, it's not. It's a Taikan Koyoshugu, which is big ships and big guns, which is their deterrent strategy. And this is a strategy put forward by several officers, not really Yonai, he's not really that keen on it, but other it is put forward, and he acquiesces to it. It is a core strategy of Japanese deterrence. Big ships, big guns. I was going to say I'm not sure I agree with B.K. Young because he seems to think no battleship should have been built in the 30s and that those rise of carriers was foreseeable even then. Yeah, it's that there is, there are books out there which are very badly written. And um, I'm presuming it's the one which isn't written in English that I thought that is, is from the myth. There is a couple, there are a couple which are written in English. Uh, but those ones are... No one takes them seriously. They're... Hmm, yeah. Now. So basically, and I have copied this out of one of my previous ones on the Kandai Kesson, but basically what I'm saying is I think the log logical strategy the Japanese are going to pursue is the interception attrition operations, Yogiki Segen Sakusen, um, with Yogiki Sakusen and the strategy carrying on, and that is going to be their overwhelming strategy to begin with. Okay? They are going to be presuming that. However, I do think it likely that they head to Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong will likely fall. The question is, how how do the British react to Hong Kong falling? I consider how they react to Singapore falling. Or Cyprus falling. They don't reinforce failure. They wait till they have the ch until things are ripe and then they attack back. So we'll think about that. And I think the Japanese will find themselves in an issue. So the British war plan. Well, think Anaconda from the American Civil American Anaconda plan from the American Civil War. Basically, the British war plan has and Richard Dunley, who was the guest on this week's episode of Bill Trumps, has written some beautiful journal articles on this. And when I say beautiful journal articles, I mean really beautiful journal articles. Um, let's see if I can find a link to it. Oh, do, 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 yes, economic warfare. Um, I will put it in, and the Richard Dunley article. And basically, you find the British have been doing a, a, a masses of work. on analyzing the Japanese economy. Finding out what resources come from the UK, what resources come from the British Empire, what trade goes through British control, tra uh, British control points, 
where they can and where they can deal with it. So again, that is what the British are going to be focusing on. So let's start going through this. Well, here are the arteries of empire as far as Britain's concerned. And this is, again, one of the interesting points to think about. Look at all that trade. If Britain can block Japan off at Singapore so they can still reach Australia through the Indian Ocean and through the Suez Canal and through the Mediterranean, if they, they presume Japan won't have be able to get through the Panama Canal, but they can secure that, and they will put some probably some forces down at the Falklands to make sure Japan can't get out of South America, can't get around South America, and probably have to do some defending of Canada. That's going to be a factor. Remember, defending Canada is going to be a factor. But again, Japan historically didn't manage to get to Canada um, because getting to Canada is not very good trade or economically wise then the British economy is going to be pretty much unaffected by the war. Note what I'm saying here. You would have a major war going on where all efforts that can be are being put into supplying the Royal Navy of equipment whilst the flow of trade would be proceeding as per normal. So there would be no impact on British trade virtually at all, other than ships being taken up from trade to support the movement of the Navy for, uh, Navy to the Far East and support the operations that way. And the Americans don't need to fight, uh, as I said, Spencer, the Americans don't need to fight Japan, they just need to not ensure, to not ensure that ships going there are against our interdiction. The, um, the Americans could just declare themselves neutral and stop the flight trade. And if we consider this, the critical Japanese trade routes are with America. You can see that. South America. Uh, but mostly, look at where all that trade from Japan is going and China. Look at that archery. Each one of these uh, dots represents a ship of over a certain tonnage. These are 300 tons gross ships. Of above, these are the big three thousand. These are the big ships of over three thousand tons gross. Yeah. British T-class subs around Hong Kong would be a good idea. Well, that is one of the scenarios you get, but there aren't many T-class boats in service at this point. I remember there are 12. So I think you probably see them ending up at Singapore. Would, no, I mean, would that be the informal British Empire possession of South America? I know. Imagine what Millington Drake, etc., and the other... Uh, other ambassadors like him would do in their South American nations to deal with the Japanese trying to trade with them. The British war plan. The same plan as we use every time, Pinky. In this case, it actually does take us, let us take over the world. Let's be honest... The British war plan has proved very effective throughout history. Um, blockade and just keep uh, just keep our economy running longer than you can. Um, go go lander. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Okay, I know there is this weird history and this weird belief of the Americans and the British being at war with each other or not liking each other in the 1920s and 30s, but it's mostly twaddle. Yes, you can find people, but in the Yangtze, in the as I said the other day, in the uh, Panay incident, you know the 
the first ships to turn up were British sloops. The US Navy and the Royal Navy had been working together for about 30, 40 years at this point and knew each other intimately and were very close. There is the Pilgrim Society, which has been producing, has been getting politicians together and funding groups and organising meetings, etc., from about the 1890s uh, for this point to this point. So that's about four, oh, 50 years. Um, one of the things you trouble is with history is you hear a lot, and the Pilgrim Society, I've got the book around here somewhere around uh, that I've been showed you the other day. Um, the thing about the Pilgrim Society. And the other parts of history is you hear a lot about the German-American lobby. You hear a lot about the um, Italian-American lobby. You hear a lot about the, the various lobbies that are involved in America. You don't hear about the Anglo-American lobby a lot. And you don't hear about it a lot because they've never been that cause of contention. Because there's always been more of an agreement with Britain than anything else. Um, as one American admiral once put it, blood is thicker than water. So, yeah. And honestly, the best way for America to avoid Japan, uh, avoid the Royal Navy, Britain becoming the most powerful nation in the world, unquestionably, is if they get involved in the war and back the British up. So which Japanese naval base gets Taranto? Cure is possible, but ours will be a attractive target. That is the interesting scenario. Um, I haven't actually got that far. Although that is certainly an option, and that is something which is the good thing about. Mainly because my theory is that the Japanese try and do the war of attrition on the British. How much giant Russia's how much oil does the Japanese bar off the Americans early in, in, in 1939? A lot. Most of, the Jap most of the oil that Japan uses at this point comes from America. And again, you've got no bases, no preparation of the troops. You can't do a rapid descent on the Philippines and Indochina. You don't have the ability to do that. You don't have the supplies there. Take care, Amelia. So, this is the war plan for Britain in case of war with Japan in terms of where they need to put destroy uh, cruisers. Now, you'll notice at the moment they've got a plan for 28 on Hong Kong. But that 28 on Hong Kong might not be in Hong Kong. They could also be operating from Manila. They could also be operating from Wei Hai Wei, uh, or, which is where they actually were planning to operate from to blockade Japan if they need to do a close blockade. But you'll notice that this is all quite a distant blockade. They have set up a blockade around Japan, which, if we consider it, is strung through Southeast Asia in the Caribbean and on the coast of Canada. And that this is, by the way, where the number for 70 cruisers come from. Prague. I mean, the fact that America and the UK don't go to war in the 30s is a nice point against the theory rising powers are prone to going to war per prove this hegemon, which is an interesting debate in modern day. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jason, how much of a stockpile of fuel does the Argent have in 1949 if the US suddenly embargoes them? Pretty sure they have almost nothing. They certainly haven't been stockpiling enough. They've just finished their war. They've just finished doing major operations against China. And you must remember they're still having fight. Uh, the, the Japanese army is still having fights, and in 1939 we'll have quite a lot of fights uh, historically with Russia and the Soviet Union. Um, I would also point out one of the interesting things, uh, Primark, uh, from history, is that whilst the theory of the rising hegemon going to war with the previous hegemon, etc., does hold boot in some periods. There is also a scenario that quite often a nation which is picked by everyone as being the rising hegemon doesn't become the hegemon. Uh, if we consider in most of, the, uh, n uh, most of the late 19th century, the rising hegemon in everyone's mind was Germany, not America. And Germany ended up losing. Um, beware of the title rising hegemon. Because you look it, it's, it can be a poison chalice. It's kind of like in British politics, 
oh, you're a future Prime Minister. Almost everyone who's ever been declared as being a future Prime Minister has never become Prime Minister. In this scenario, the troubles battles they're involved. Are they turned loose on shipping, or do they free up cruisers to go to other trade? Because a good trade protection makes a good radar. Um, there are 12 tribals in service in January 1939. The remainder are coming into service. So the tribals are already there. And there are already other tribals which are preparing to be ordered. And in the American study restriction, which become a tree drive towards war. This a map, by the way, both these maps come from the archives, from a uh, from a various archive uh, from archive documents in the UK National Archives. So neither of these maps are mine; they're both from the National Archives. This is an actual; these are actual Admiralty maps, which were produced in the nineteen thirties. Where's the profit in the crippling trade with Britain? The US has already irked that Japan wants China as exclusive domain. Yeah. And America wants to be... And basically, in the case of war with Japan, this is where Britain's proving its cruiser forces. And... Mm -hmm. I too, if you are future ex, it generally means the current ex and anyone else who wants to be ex in the future start gunning for you to want to mine you. Yep. Now, Japan will have an issue. Um, I would agree some video photographer, mainly because anyone who is that interested in trains has got to produce a better infrastructure system than we have today on Michael Portillo becoming Prime Minister. Stephen Richards, if this does kick off, does lines get blocked? Well, that's the first thing I'm going to have to discuss, uh, talk about because one of the first things, once we go back to this scenario, um just check I've got to the end. So, yeah. I'm going to talk about that, but sorry, nights ago, I don't think the battle... I, I think if we consider... I'll get into the fight destruction of those things. But what you can see now is the British are planning blockading Japan. Japan are planning waiting for Britain to come in. So this is why I wrote this Night 601. I don't think the battle you're hoping for happens. Not immediately. And I'll talk in why, but in the nicest way, the battle in 1939... In, in 1939, the first three to four months of war is going to be the British establishing their blockade and getting their fleet and forces uh, set out there, up there and working out what allies they have. And it's going to be the Japanese preparing for the British to come up. So it's going to be nothing. And um, probably Japan's going to get well, a tired waiting for the British because the British are going to be timing it. The British have a timeline. By the way, we've, and all, under all this economic strategy, the British have a timeline and a knowledge of how much resources the Japanese have stockpiled. And they have a lot of intelligence going on. Again, if you read the intelligence books, you'll find out the British naval intelligence is being very thorough about what exactly stockpiles Japan has. And they will be working out exactly how much they have and what they're getting and what they're using up. And that's a problem for Japan because they're not going to be getting new stockpiles, whereas Britain's going to still be selling stuff. Uh, Frank Lauder, that is as interesting as I would like to get into that topic. That's kind of completely off topic for today's discussion. So I'm not going to get into that one. Um, but save it for Sunday for brew ships, and I'll happily ask and answer question. Uh, Juicy, 28 crews in Hong Kong is a very funny problem with the IGN. They can't defeat that without leaving everything else undefeated. And please note, of course, that's just the cruisers. That's not where the capital ships are based, the destroyers, the submarines. This is just literally the cruisers. Richards. Clark with an E. I'm not that fussy, but I'm Clark with an E. If you're going to use my if you're going to call me Mr. Clark, it's Clark with an E. Because I didn't suffer through 
15 years of schooling and two year, first two years of my bachelor's of people calling me Clark E, not to use the E. They thought it was, they thought it was hilarious. I thought that frankly I went, you're just calling me by my surname. It really doesn't matter. Um... Don't uh, on. I don't think the Japanese are going to have many allies. If eight countries in the 1930s and being belligerent and treating negotiations of the Japanese won't help Germany and Italy have a, uh, won't help. And Germany and Italy haven't had um, the success they do in 1939-40 yet. And they haven't had their alliance. Now, Mara, was this planning in concept the equivalent of the US Commerce Department like it would be today? Or was this planning being entirely within the Navy? Um... Broadly speaking, there wasn't really a commerce department like there is today in the US and the UK. Uh, there were departments, etc., which had relevant information, but they were more supplying information. And the Royal Navy didn't always trust it, because the Royal Navy sometimes had better information than that. What role do I see for the tribals against the IGN? Well, they're going to be carrier escorts, for one thing. Um, I, do, I could see them being escort for that, but also, again, it comes back to the night fighting doctrine. And they're going to be with the destroyers, providing the heads and providing the leads for the destroyer forces and going in. No, sorry. With the British Empire essentially fine, aren't they going to have to deal with the RAF too? The trouble for the RAF in this scenario is the RAF don't have any skin in the game. In other words, they don't have any long-range bombers capable of reaching Japan from any bases in the UK or any bases in this area. Even Hong Kong is not close enough. You need to get to Wei Hai Wei to have bases which are capable of, of British heavy bombers actually reaching Japan. And by heavy bombers, I mean Lancaster bombers. I don't mean anything in service in 1939. So, yeah, there are issues. We'll get into them. <laughs> there is no mistake, Lord Clarky. <laughs> just to mix it up this week. Look, hope you're all. All's well. All's well. <laughs> the Canadian base would be very interesting. Eskimo is always interesting. Um, pretty much, Frank. We've discussed this, but I'm actually going straight back to this. So. One of the things that you have to consider as a factor is that that British war plan and the Japanese war plan means that the odds are there's not going to be much fighting initially, but there is going to be an impact on these. In that the British are going to have the supplies. So we all know what happens historically with the British in 1939. Churchill, in September 1939, Churchill comes back as first uh, as Lord of the Admiralty. And he issues a moratorium stopping the Admiralty, uh, st uh, pausing the build construction of capital ships and carriers in favour of small escorts. What would he do with a war against Japan? Well, he's not going to do that, because Japan is a major fleet that has a lot of carriers and has a lot of capital ships, and you're going to need a lot to be able to cover the Far East and deal with, your, deal with potentially Germany and Italy, which are growing up. So instead of seeing a capital ship and carrier pause, you're going to see a capital ship and carrier acceleration, which thanks to, if we go back to this slide... The fact that Japan, we pretty much stopped from having any impact on British economy, is going to be very easy to do. So, the odds are... That those three carriers, the Illustrious, the Formidable and the Victorious which are launched in April, August, and September 1939, are probably launched early and are probably commissioned early. They're not going to be in service, but they could well be, not going to be available forces in 1939, but probably will be by early 1940. Renown will probably be accelerated again. Uh, Queen Elizabeth and Valiant will be accelerated, as much as they can be. The King George V will be accelerated. And probably as many of these will be finished as possible. Now, the Royal Navy will probably still continue its policy of building slu uh, the, building the uh, flower class corvettes, etc., which they've been planning. But, yes, there's going to be acceleration for the Lion class and those vessels as well.
Now, for Japan, it's the opposite. For Japan, well, if you consider the amount of resources in their initial period of the capture and the amount of resources they report they're importing in 1939 to help them finish off their carriers, etc., finish off their capital ships, this is going to slow them down. They, they don't have rubber. They don't have the oils. They don't have all the, all the materials they need to finish off those ships. So an accelerated process would look like double ships. So basically, in under normal construction policy, you have one shift a day. Right? Working in daylight hours. Under wartime, you can have a night shift added on and you'll have double shifts and you have more people working on them. You also have to remember this is a different scenario as well because we can, some people then will start bringing up the dates of, well, you know, World War II, this was how the British were building fast. But remember, in this scenario, the British are fighting a war on the other side of the world from them. They're not getting bombed. There are no bombs dropping on Britain. The, tr fr the trade is flowing freely around the world as far as the British are concerned. There are no bombs dropping on Britain. The amount of resources they can therefore afford to chuck into their navy, which is their primary weapon for a war against Japan, is going to be pretty impressive. So basically, think those shipyards will be working 24 hours a day. They'll be working. They could be. There could be three eight-hour shifts on. There could be. Um, sometimes they do overlapping. Uh, they do overlapping shifts. They the, each yard has their own sort of style of prop, of approach. Actually, I was going to. I presume the Iron still plans for Germany and builds more sloops and corvettes because Munich has happened and Britain knows war might happen. Yes. But the thing is, again, those who aren't, they're not going to pause capital ship construction for it. But also, they're not fighting a war against Germany while they're going into full war building. So also expect the war building to begin in Australia, to begin in Canada, to begin everywhere. And again, this is going to be done during a time when there isn't the strain. And they're able to buy what they want from America. And this is where the other problem comes in for Germany. Now, <laughs> right, so here is the problem that comes along, and I'm going to be talking about this in a second, is that this war started, but who's going to be part of it? Who's going to be part of it, and, you know, what's happening? So, if we go back into the British war plan, sorry, Knights of the I don't think you're going to get this battle. Not in this form. Not at this quick time. And that's going to probably affect the introduction of the of the, uh, the B-5s and all the other cool, cool uh, Japanese aircraft because of rubber and other issues. Now, this is the British Knight Doctrine Operationals. Night action. If contact between capital ships has not been made during the day, or if the day action has been incisive, the Admiral will decide whether or not to seek a night action between capital ships. Now remember, Japanese carrier and night action it concentrates around destroyer attacks, destroying cruiser attacks with, with torpedoes. British night action involves carriers and capital ships. So basically, in the British, uh, the Japanese scenario versus the Americans, night action, their cruisers have an advantage because they have the Congos with them. In the British scenario, night action versus the British cruisers. Hello, how the Congos? Have you met the? Uh, have you met HMS War Spikes? Hello, I'm called War Spikes. Have you met HMS Hood? Hello, I'm called Hood. Have you met HMS Repulse? Hello, I'm here. As an extra. Have you met HMS Renown? Hello. I've just come out of refit early. Just for you. You happy to see me, Congos? This point, Congos going. Excuse me. We were promised Northampton class cruisers. No better. 
I would like to lodge a complaint with the ma with the manager. This was promised to be a Northampton class cruiser or worse. Not that thing. Not War Spite. No. Rodney will be with uh, Rodney will be with the main battle line coming along progressively. Now, if the light forces are able to close the enemy battle fleet at dusk or located after dark, they may be able to attack with great effect and produce opportunities for obtaining the decisive results in subsequent battles with capital ships. Now, remember, the Royal Navy, they have their night fighting doctrine is to get very, very close. Use the tribals in front of the destroyers. They charge in. They blast away with their guns. Their guns hit targets, set fires on the enemy enemy light forces, and then your light you use those fires as fixing points to fire torpedoes at those destroyers at close range. So yeah, this is the and remember again, British ships have radar and are getting radar fitted in January 1939. The Japanese don't. Nine six eight three one. Again, that massive carrier killing bomb is not in service yet. It's coming into service, and I do agree it could get through an armored carrier's flight deck and could cause severe damage. But there again, other bombers do bombs do cause severe damage. But first of all, they have to hit it, and that means they have to find it. We're going to be talking about the air war at the end. I'm going to get into specific air fights. Dan Hoon, renowned repulse hood war spite. Oh, hello, Congo Cast. We're World War One era two. That makes us officially fair. Officially fair. <laughs> mm -hmm. Dad Room tries to work out what's going to be carrying the Japanese super bomb XAB, and well, that's the other problem. Um, it's the case of you, they are going to have some of the B5Ns in service, but how many do they have in service, and how many are they available? Um, is going to be an interesting matter. It's going to be an interruption of critical in, critical in supplies coming in at a, a very critical time. And again, they're going to have to take carrier groups offline to uh, to load them on. Now, so what likely happens? Well. In a Britain and Empire plus France and Netherlands battle, because in the nicest way there is no scenario I see where the French and Netherlands, I the French and Dutch do not join with the British in this. Um, you get the full blockade scenario and then slowly working up. However, I'm sure the Americans join in as well at some point. There is the, the, the display of the Americans is they either join in late or they join in straight at the beginning. They either join in late once it looks like the British, near, uh, the British and the French and Netherlands and Dutch are going to win, and actually going to do something. In which case they join in because they don't want to be left out. In case, because as I've said before, it's the people who show up who get to decide the fate of things. Or alternatively, Britain and Empire and USA and ally, European allies start off straight away. America immediately declares war, which is where. Not War Plan Orange comes in, but Rainbow Five. Rainbow Five is the American strategy for a multi-alliance war against Japan. It's carry the, If you want to look up something interesting, it's called the Plan Dog Memo. So, would you see the Americans being around the sideline, shining, saying "Good luck"? They would possibly in this scenario. They would be initially, but the thing is. 
Uh, th there is a problem for this scenario. In this scenario, it gets set up and it's very much a British command and control scenario. So then when the Americans join, they have to join in and under the British command. Their fleet would be under the British command. It would be it would be a task force command structure. So it'd be the American task force under command of the British CNC, who would be the overall force commander, because you need someone in overall command. You can't have a command by committee. You have to actually have someone in command of theater operations. But it's uh, that would also be more likely to be Cunningham. And this scenario, you are more likely to have Cunningham. Under uh, this scenario, you're more likely to have um, keys. So, under this scenario, I feel, think you still end up with a British Commander-in-Chief, because I do not see how the British, who have been the aggrieved party, settle for anything other than a British officer being a Commander-in-Chief of the Combined Forces. Um... That's going to be it. Basically, that's going to be it. I there, I I think the Americans would also understand that, and the Americans again, if we consider their pragmatic approach in World War Two to scenarios, in some scenarios they're British CNCs, in other scenarios they're American CNCs, and it goes with the scenario. I think what you might see is a division of theaters where you get the Central Pacific approach uh, being the American theater with an American theater commander and the Southeast Asia approach to Japan being a British theater commander. I think that's the scenario you'd probably get. But the interesting thing is you could end up with a scenario of a battle taking place where you have the combined carrier force of Ark Royal, Lexington Courageous, Saratoga, Glorious Yorktown, Furious Enterprise, teaming up with some probably added illustrious class vessels um, to fight the battle versus the Japanese. So if everyone wants to figure out what that battle turns into, my mental maths puts that at probably a formation of roughly 10 carriers versus the Japanese force, which will be five or six carriers. And I'm fairly sure that's enough aircraft that there isn't anything coming back. So, could you imagine King under a British CNC? It would be interesting, but the thing is... You, it, it, Britain is the aggrieved party in this scenario. Please note, in the Pacific War, Britain was happy to take a, second, a, a, a step back for America in some regards, even in the late, and even when the British Pacific Fleet turns up, because of Pearl Harbor, America is considered the aggrieved party because they were attacked. In this scenario, Britain's the aggrieved party. Down for a minute. Plot armor alert. This is reaching cart in the wheel of, 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 of unbelievability. Um, how long did the IGN last? Honestly, I think they... Basically, they probably get through 1939 fine because I don't think anyone actually attacks them. I think 1939 is basically a year where Britain's building up its forces. And here's the other scenario. So if Britain, Empire, France and Netherlands are joined in fighting this, then they're already united front and already heavily mobilized and already building up for war. Which means they're going to be on higher alert even back in Europe, which is going to change the scenarios for Germany. But, and I consider America be joining this far more likely, if America is a member of this, then America's already part of it, which we're already allied. So if Germany or Italy decides to go to war, and the real thing is, what, the nicest way, Hitler might decide to go to war, but will Il Duce decide to go to war? Because if Il Duce decides he's not going to go to war against the Allies, then it's a very different scenario again for Germany. There's also a third scenario here, which is, and I've discussed it before, the odds of actually Germany and Italy joining the war on the Allied side. Because both of them want to be seen as these big, powerful world power nations. So you could get something like the Dunkirks and Scharnhorst and Neisenau teaming up uh, teaming up to be a fast ca fast capital ship group for the allies 
Think about that. That is a very real possibility in the scenario. The Germans and the Italians decide to join the Allies fighting the Japanese as a way to show their power and capabilities on the world stage. We well, have to remember, whilst the Americans do want a, don't tend to want a, um, like, tend to like a combined task force in 1939, they do have doctrine for it, and the British have doctrine for multi-carrier operations, so this would represent the ultimate in multi-carrier doctor operations. It would also represent the ultimate in nightmare scenarios. Nagato and Matsuo versus Nelson and Rodney at the centre of a decisive battle makes a very interesting thought game. It does. Uh, if Enterprise, Rodney and Warspite sell together to Japan, do the Japanese shells magically explode in barrels because fate hates them at that point? Uh, I'm not certain what happens, but basically these ships do have a lot of plot armour. But actually, in regards to where I was on the impression that they were such uh, they had some economic issues at hands and needed to go to grab some land. Um, that is often pointed out. But again, if they go to war on the side of the Allies, a it's a status thing, and b in the nicest way they might consider they get rewards of Japanese territories in the Far East and get to re get Singtao back. This is the point. Imagine Hitler with the idea in his head that he would get Singtao back. He would get Singtao in the peace settlement. Get it returned. Return the German territory lost after World War One, And then think about how big an ego he has. And yes, he would do any, He would pursue that. I'm glad, I'm glad I'll still not go to Il Idris. Uh, you know, you'll go to war with us if we attack anyone thing in this scenario. Um, you remember, he had pro when he signed the agreement with um, with Il Duce to go to war. He promised him that war wasn't going to come before 1942. So he promised him that 1943, actually, was it 1943? I think. And um, Il Duce was very annoyed when war broke out in 1939 because Italy wasn't ready. Under this scenario, if Italy, and again, Il Duce likes to play the world stage. He likes to be seen as the big man in the world. He'd more than likely want to send some ships out with the Allies, especially his new battleships and things like that. So, in the nicest way, he might well be part of the Alliance and might go, We are war! We're fighting! They're fighting on our side! Why? Why? And it could well be more sensible for him. It's going to make it very, very complicated. I still think there will be a European war, but I think it might be after this is over. In that case, Germany already eaten up Austria and Czechoslovakia. What will be the allied view on that? Uh, necessary evil if they're fighting alongside us. Remember, we spent we were allied with the Soviet Union for X number of years fighting Germany. And what about Russia? Well, Russia has kept fighting battles against the Soviet Union, has kept fighting against the Japanese a lot. So, again, they might well join in. Hitchman. If Hitler goes to war against Britain and America's at war with Japan as an island of Britain, I can't see America then not then joining in. No, because America would have an alliance with uh, with Britain and it would be a case of you attack one of the allies, you attack all the allies. Sidra 90. How would Britain handle some Japan's submarine fleet since they're primarily targeted warships? Actually, that's probably quite good for the British considering the amount of ASDIC they have and that is pretty much their doctrine. So expect the destroyers around Royal Navy task groups to be going all out for dealing with submarines. 
and that would be their policy. Plus, again, they'd be using swordfish, etc. This is another reason. The whole idea of perpetual operations of, of Royal Navy carriers was because you needed to maintain a fighter cap and an anti something warfare patrol. Take care, Wayne. Will the Germans deploy U-boats? They don't have many U-boats in 1939, and uh, mostly not till the end of 1939. Uh, no, sorry, a Singtar. Need, well, if the battle that's actually taking place in Singtar, yes, they need to play, spend a lot to rebuild because it blow, got blown on sky high. Probably still get blown sky high in this uh, scenario because the British and Americans will probably need to level it. This war probably doesn't end with atomics. The British would have no desire to invade the Japanese home islands, but they would have every desire to um, cut them off economically and ground their economy to dust. So probably it ends after about three, four years. Van Room. Italian fleet goes to the war in the Far East. Looks gorgeous. It runs out of fuel halfway. No, but I wouldn't be surprised if the sheer number of tankers required to keep the Italian fleet going means that Italy's tanker, uh, Italy has fuel shortages back at home. Wait, would the USSR want to join us? Well, they would because that would give them a reason to get involved in a very successful war and drive Japan out of large areas of what China, Russia considered its sphere of influence in China. Why would Germany wait instead of making their land grabs while that was a distracted Pacific? Because, again, they're going to be at full alert, but where are the armies going to be? In the nicest way, in this scenario, there's no large army deployments. There are occasional army deployments, but they're not going to be massive. Maybe, maybe a thing, maybe a few things, but you know. It gets interesting. Now, under this scenario, there are some scenarios which I do see. Now, I avoided getting into a Taranto-style attack because I that's basically the fourth scenario, and I thought that could be the question I would put at the end of the Long Patrol, of in how, where do you think Britain would launch its Taranto-style operation if it did? So the race for Singapore is the first one. And this scenario I see as the thing of the Japanese could well try and pulse their own carriers south to try and interfere with the British reinforcement of, of Singapore. Now, it depends what they have ready, but they probably have two to three carriers they can call on at maximum, probably two. And for Japan, this is not necessarily a good idea because, yes, they'll get mobilized, but the carriers, the first carrier to arrive will be the carrier from the Mediterranean. Which, in January 1939, the carriers operating around the Mediterranean are Ark Royal and Glorious. So they're sort of roughly in that area. So those will be the first two carriers to arrive for the British, and the first two carriers to arrive for the Japanese, etc. And they'd be heading for Singapore. Now, Singapore does have Wilder, uh, Wilderbeest and other protections, but also, to get to Singapore, you have to go past the Philippines, you have to go past... Hong Kong, you have to go for us lots of places which are going to be problematic to get past. So, the point is, and when you arrive, if you arrive early enough, then you launch your aircraft, attack Singapore Harbour, and find nothing's there waiting for you. Which is a problem, so you have to launch a scout aircraft first... And then that scout aircraft can't use its radios because if it does the radio signal, British radar, British radios will pick it up. Plus, there is, of course, development of... There is radar being deployed in the Singapore area, etc. So all of these mean that there are issues in the race for Singapore as a doctrine. There is also HMS Hermes wandering around. And here is your problem if you're doing a race for Singapore to forestall the British. You don't want to be oper You could well be operating under a scenario, and the Japanese did operate like this on occasion, where you do maintain a minimal air group in the air, and the British have HMS Hermes. 
Again, Hermes is loaded with swordfish. They do night attacks. Japan doesn't do night attacks. So, Hermes, if she's found during the day by the Japanese, will no doubt be attacked and sunk on the way. If she's found during the day. However, Hermes, operating probably with a cruiser buddy, one of that 5th cruiser squadron, whichever one of Birmingham's sisters is still around, uh, Birmingham's cousins, because they're mostly canning class, are still around, will no doubt be keeping herself discreet. And probably not on a, not in a port, but um, how do I put this politely? Hugging areas of presumed safety. So Japan's force will be racing south to try and get there. Now if we consider again the whole Singapore scenario, well, if we look at Singapore, to get to Singapore from Cure, you would go through the uh, through uh, I uh, probably probably on the Pacific side of Taiwan between Taiwan and the Philippines down the center of the South China Sea and race. Now, you can get there quite quickly. That's true. You can launch your attack. You try and kind basically your plan is to attack uh, Pearl Harbor the British or uh, British as they arrive in Singapore. But there are air defences there and they will be looking for you. And you've only got two carriers this time. Your other problem is this. If on the way down, it, there is going to be night, if Hermes manages to position herself, and remember, she's coming out from Hong Kong. Hong Kong and Shanghai is where she's operating. So she's operating in that middle area. If she manages to find the fleet at night, thanks to her swordfish, then while she's only got 15 swordfish on her, that she could launch a strike at night. This could cost the Japanese a carrier. Now, if they find Hermes, it costs the British a carrier. But either way, an attack on night by swordfish, even if it didn't cost the Japanese a carrier, would cause damage and would cause worry for the Japanese. Plus, they're heading towards Wildebeest. So, Singapore is not a good scenario. They race in. Yes, they race to Singapore. The British are racing to Singapore. The battle most likely takes place over the Singapore Straits. And the Japanese don't have the heavy strike aircraft they have, but the British also don't have the armoured carriers involved. If it's you've got Glorious and you've got Ark Royal, they could be severely damaged. They could be. Please note I'm saying they could be. The reason I'm not saying they will be is because the other thing based at Singapore at this point, which are not based there by 1941 in numbers necessarily, are a large number of flying boats, which are going around the world, are going around doing reconnaissance. There are also submarines. There are lots of things which turn the approaches to Singapore, to Hong Kong, into a frigating nightmare. So my scenario for this is the Japanese are trying to do a sort of pulse. It doesn't work well. However, I don't think this happens. I consider this a very unlikely scenario, and I consider it very unlikely for what the Japanese do, because they might win, but I think at best they lose both carriers. They use it, and the British lose two carriers. Maybe the British lose two of their bigger carriers, but the Japanese probably lose two of their bigger carriers as well. And the Japanese can't replace carriers as quickly as the British can. They certainly do not have free on the production line coming out. And for the Japanese, they'll just use a lot of fuel, a lot of ships, a lot of personnel who will be lost and they won't be able to replace them. And it doesn't fit with their strategy of overall of waiting for the enemy to come to them. They've already done the thing which is supposed to incite the enemy to come to them because of this action against Birmingham, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's a possible one to consider. Andrew Ox, the thought of the Italians working in the RN and, uh, and Marine National makes me wonder whether either of their 15 shells could be used in Italian guns to give them some degree of accuracy. Potentially. I think the French ones might be able to. 
Rice one, Dossie, what, uh, when did Japan go from leave us alone to the world to take over a big part of it? Um, basically, you can blame that on the USA and opening them up by blowing up, uh, by beating them up. Admittedly, though, that did work in Britain's favour. Um, as Dan Freeman's just put, Commodore Perry in the USA in the 1850s. Basically, they really didn't have a plan for it. They have Vildebeest? Yes, Vickers Vildebeest are land based torpedo bombers. That's right. So the short Sunderland. So the British could do, uh, so the British could do with, uh, to them what they did to Prince of Wales and Robert Holtz historically. Potentially, um, it's less likely because they have their own organic fighter power and protection, but it's potential. I'm saying it's sort of at best the Japanese get a draw, where both sides lose ships. At worst, they get uh, they lose ships, badly, for nothing. So, next most likely scenario, and this is one of the more likely scenarios for an over battle, is the... And this depends again. If the Americans enter the war, then retaking Hong Kong becomes quite easy, because if you're launching from Manila to Hong Kong, it's a very easy movement, and you can get air support almost from the Philippines. Especially once you've got B-17s, etc. based in the Philippines, which the Americans based there quite early on. And please note, my suspicion would be the British would require to be the Naval Forces Commander and the Commander-in-Chief, and the Americans would be the Air Forces Commander. And um, the British would probably, and the British Americans would probably, especially for this scenario, uh, the choice would be between a British officer or a French officer to command the ground troops, depending on which they decided would annoy MacArthur more. Again, this is based on Roosevelt not liking MacArthur and wanting anyone of written preference to him to command the ground forces for the invasion to recapture uh, Hong Kong. So, the British might let a French officer command it as a greater insult to, uh, to, um, to MacArthur. It's going to depend on whether, again, Cunningham or... Um, Keys are in charge, and I said Cunning will be in charge of the British fleet, whatever, but he would be commander in chief if you have it just the British Allies led scenario, the and then the Americans joining later. Whereas if you have a scenario the Americans joining from the beginning, I think you have Lord Key sent out there as commander in chief to begin with. The reason I'm saying this is because Lord Keys is be Lord Keys will be sent out there to do the political leadership and CNC role. And Lord Keys versus MacArthur would be an interesting battle. And I could see him picking a French general just to wind up the uh, Japanese. Uh, wind up MacArthur. Um, I could also... This is one of those scenarios... You've noticed I've avoided mentioning Byrne. And Byrne coming in. Because I think she honestly gets left behind the Atlantic. But the, uh, the French might insist on bringing her. I could, even if the Japanese get a draw in terms of ship sunk, the respect to building the battles would mean it's a British win. Yes, because the British can build more. Dan Ernie King for US Carrier Air Forces Commander? Honestly, probably not. At this point, you're probably looking at one of the officers who's already in the Pacific at this time. Also, French have more five-star French officers and are seen as the greatest army. French have people like Vegard, etc. Yeah. Probably. I mean, would air bases be available in southern China? You'd have to build them. There aren't air bases there at this point, but you'd have to build them. Which means you'd also have to supply them, so you'd have to get logistics. There is no air force getting involvement, getting there to get in range, until you have already got the fleet there, have already taken the place, and have set up the logistics line, and are able to run convoys for your supplies. So, basically, the air force are going to get involved at some point, but they're not going to get involved anytime soon in the early part of the war. So it's going to be the, it's going to be the US Army Air Corps leading it from the Philippines.
John South, especially as the Vanguard and Gamelin had been major parts of Fox World War One Allied Command Force and still had good reputations. Yep. Which would be annoying for MacArthur to deal with, but he'd probably deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's probably bulkly a British Indian army, but the thing about putting a French officer as commander-in-chief ground forces is because there'd be Dutch, British, French contingents. Um, it would work out that way. Basically, it's a good way of... Um, Spreading out the diplomatic thing, a uh, dipl uh, diplomacy, Michael Cooch. It's not really a case of the French are supplying the army. It's no, the aggregate forces, the French are probably the third largest contributor. Therefore, they get the army command because, frankly, that's the least important at this point. Now, Hong Kong is a very different scenario because you'll likely have Japanese land base there. Um, probably from the army. And you could end up having a decisive battle because there'll be quite a large proportion of the Allied fleet there. It'd be interesting because the Japanese might not be able to do the whole um, attrition they wanted to do before the battle because the South China Sea could be a very hostile place, especially with, with using air bases which the French have in Vietnam and Laos, unless the IJ, IGA have launched an attack into um, Indochina. But actually launching an attack over the Chinese-Vietnamese border, as the Chinese army will tell you, having fought over that border a few times, is not really a good and sensible idea. That border between northern Vietnam and uh, the north of Vietnam and China is really not a hospitable place for an army to try and transit, and it can be quite brutally defended. A bit like Abdacom. Yeah. That's right. No Bengal famine in 33 plus India gets dominion status so the British will need to build infrastructure in India. Yeah. It will be interesting. I think you have a lot of a big battle in this scenario. And I think this would take place probably in 1940 sometimes. So, you probably would see quite a lot of B5Ns being part of it. You might also see, as said, um, in armoured car carriers having come out. And those armoured carriers might well have aboard them single seat fighters. Italy and Germany might choose to get involved just for prestige. Yeah, that said, I think they would get involved with prestige, so I think they'd be part of it. So, so early war is naval blockade of Japan, followed by exp uh, expansion of ground war in China as allies join the Chinese. Does this mean Chiang Kai-shek is replaced and the communists lose the civil war? Uh, Chiang Kai-shek might be replaced. He might not be. He might actually prove successful. If he's given the supplies and support, he might prove successful enough and actually win. Who knows? It will change the scenario. In China, in Chi in China, um, I think you're more likely to see, especially if the British get Hong Kong, is the flow of supplies to the Republic of China forces will be colossal. Oodles and oodles of supplies. Don't dream. I don't think the Japanese even have Hanin until February 1939. If that goes ahead, then the Iron Sub Force in theatre may have fun. 
Yeah, the the RN subforce will be uh, growing up dramatically. The British will be sending every sub they can out there. Remember, the T-class boats were designed with the Far East in mind. Plus, there's the rivers and the other vessels. So, they've got mine-laying subs, all sorts of things. So, I think the attrition might be on both sides. But I still could see there being a big battle as the amphibious forces try to head for, uh, head for Hong Kong and a protection. And this is where I think that multi-carrier force comes in. Because I could see the British and the Ameri and the old, despite the Americans being probably putting aircraft on the Philippines, especially if they're involved and they're supporting the at attack, I could see every single aircraft carrier they have and every single capital ship. So it'd be kind of like the combined Allied fleet would be covering the amphibious task group. And that would be a absolutely colossal battle. Now, again, the interesting scenario would be what would happen. I think the British aircraft would take the lead by attacking the Japanese at night. I think they'd probably find the Japanese first because they'd have so many assets out there hunting for the Japanese. And we do remember they did crack the Japanese codes. So, and hist historically, I think the British, pro British and Americans probably know the Japanese are coming. They probably tra are tracking them. And I think probably at night they get attacked by the British. And the plan, and then the Americans do a mass attack in dawn in the next in the following day. Whatever's left will be uh, basically they get a night air attack by the British, then a dawn air attack by the Americans, and then they get the battleships. Because again, if this is the British leading it, this is British doctrine. I wouldn't be surprised if the British then charge in, uh, the the battleships then go in and finish off whatever's left. So think about that. You've got a British-led attack in the air at night, maybe an ongoing one throughout the night, to maintain contact with the Japanese throughout the night in terms of air attacks, but also to keep up the pressure. And then a massive American-style alpha strike in the morning of their from their carriers. Um, if there's anything left of the Japanese... I doubt the Japanese carriers will be left after that. I, I doubt there'll be much of the other ships left after that. But other than that, after that, I think you have every single capital ship the British and the Americans can muster of their fast capital ships. I think our class vessels and the earlier standards which are around would probably be supporting the amphibious task group ready to start bombarding Hong Kong. And I think things like the Queen Elizabeth class... Uh, the King George V's, Renown, Repulse, Hood, um, the faster American capital ships, and Dunkirk's, if they're there, Nizer now and Scharnhorst and the Latorios would be going in to fight the Japanese. I wouldn't be surprised if you had a scenario that whatever's less is facing five to one odds of Allied capital ships versus them. Shang was literally the best the KMT had. Sadly enough, yes. I have a detailed map of Hong Kong defences. Land defence, shore batteries, minefields, searchlights from Natakas. Would it be interesting to get a copy? Yes, please. Azuski, if war is three to four years, would we see the Grau Zeppelin built in Germany? Potentially. But potentially the Germans would actually look at British carry operations and the burn operations and go, you know what, we need. We cannot commission the, the Grau Zeppelin. It's going to be terrible. It's actually atrocious. We do not want to touch that. That is the other problem. There could be an acceleration of Italian and ja Italian and German and naval knowledge by operating alongside the Allies. But there's also going to be an Italian, an absolute acceleration of knowledge from the from Britain and America, etc., from actually getting to use their equipment. No, you don't know how awful Sheng was. Uh, no, Sheng wasn't good. He was just. There. He was just there, but because, in the nicest way, again, and this is going to sound terrible, but real politic is, and often dictates these things. Why would we? Uh, the the allies won't want to change Chiang Kai Shek because Chiang Kai Shek is someone they know. He's a known quantity to them. They won't interfere, unless there's someone else in there who can hold the Republic of China together better. They will not interfere. Romney Renown and Warspite from a betting pool over Hamley. Who knows what happens? Prime, what a short, sharp conflict on the negotiation end. 
Would that be much likely to get someone involved? Not really. The British, as I've said before, the British are not really interested in the negotiated end of a short, sharp conflict. If they've annihilated the entire Japanese fleet, then they will start nego they will start negotiating after they've bombarded Tokyo. And that's the scenario. If this battle goes the way it's likely to go, then, as said, it's it, it, it's not a case of if the Japanese manage to catch the Allies on the hoof, then they can cause some serious damage. But under this scenario, you have both the British and the Americans putting their mass carrier forces out there. In which case, the British can do the night operations and can absolutely keep that contact all night gone. Which means during the dawn, uh, dawn, the Americans know exactly where the Japanese are. So there's no searching of their aircraft out. There's just a pulse, we go in this direction. And there's probably a British shadowing aircraft going, Come to me, boys! They're there! Go take them out! It's just... It's basically the closest you get to the Marianas turkey shoot. After a bit of it, would there be more gunfighters in given the limitations of the aircraft this time? Probably. Hi, Steve. Regiment, then the Republic of China still falls, unfortunately, and communists will still take over, unfortunately, but it's what it is. Eh, possibly, but it's possible that it's going to sound sane, it's strange. If the Republic of China is getting a lot more support from the rest of the world and a lot more involvement and investment and doesn't have to go through what it does in during the in, uh, during the rest of the next six years, because remember, it's, it's 1939 to 1945 and they sort of fall down. If they don't have to do that, then they might recover. And they might do better. Well, the courageous is depending on how many survive will go to scrappers after war. Yep. Problem. Was that Navy's desire of civilian leadership? Would that desire for long conflict survive international pressure for any peace? What international pressure would there be for peace, Primark 359? Who's going to be pressuring Britain for peace against Japan? As said, America's probably on our side. Who's going to be, who, who's going to be pressuring Britain for peace? Who's going, who, what pressure exists there for peace? So especially when you consider Britain and America at this point are the largest powers in the world. By a long country mile. And who wants to get into an argument with either of them, let alone of them, if they're combined and on the side, on the same side? No. And it's still not going to... In the nicest way as well, there's not going to be fighting at home. There's not going to be bombing at home. This is going to be a distant war, which is going to be mostly considered victorious. Sadly, yes, it's going to be tens of thousands of men are probably going to die in this battle. But it might be a lot less than World War II historically. Yeah, it could be. And it's going to be seen as a naval war. There's not going to be the ground war. That's if the Japanese turn up to try and contest the taking of Hong Kong. I was asking, will the USN would still be running Vindicators with Devastators just jumping in? Pretty much. Not enough. Kaga into refit in November 9th. And here it isn't just isn't commissioned until mid 1949. As I said at the beginning, John South, I did go into that at the beginning. Um, Kaga's refit she could be pulled out of. So while she's in refit, I have list, left her with numbers because in nicest way, the battles aren't going to take place in January 1939. They're probably going to take longer than that. So I still listed her on the strength. Because I was being a bit generous to the Japanese. Um, Steve, the Allies aren't attacking Singtao. 
No, uh, the, the the whole incident of Sing Tao is go go back to. There's a link down below which tells you to Sing Tao, teach the uh, which explains the Sing Tao incident. The Allies aren't going for Sing Tao. They might do. The Germans might want to take Sing Tao, in which case after Hong Kong they might roll up there. But the Japanese have got defenses, but in the nicest way, those are going to get leveled by a lot of R class battleships. Yeah, Reginald Manuel, um, there is a language rule on this one because my little cousin's watching. Hello, little cousins. Um, there are six year old little cousins watching, and I do not want to get killed by their mothers for, lang for the language. So, yeah. <laughs> so, thank you, Melanie. <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 uh, thanks to the very nice admins, I I do realize I run one of the cleanest chats on, of anyone on the, on the history scene, but literally it's because of. Hello, little cousins. How are you doing? Yeah, there's a whole... We can get completely sidelined by China, but that's not the topic of today's discussion. So, yeah. What would Canada's role be in this war? Supplying a lot of supplies. And probably the base in Eskimol, and probably they would be building up their cruiser force and their destroyer force and escort force. I could expect the Canadians to be playing a, a lot, a, a quite a large part of it. as long Like they did in World War Two. Alzaski frigate battleship. Uh, um, I think it's frigate cruiser. Uh, duck and burn are still allowed. Yes. Oh, it's different. Oddly enough, you have a completely reasonable reason to run a clean chat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> question is, so if Singtao is not a specific war objective for other nations on the journey, what would other nations look to grab in the post-war environment? Um, Britain would be retaking, uh, probably would be looking at um, securing a protectorate over Shanghai if they could. But Hong Kong is there, what they're retaking. Uh, humbling Japan certainly is a major thing. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if America and Britain are also, and Germany are interested in the Japanese island possessions. Germany would, of course, be interested in Tsingtao and would probably want to recapture Tsingtao. I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if the Germans insist on providing the ground troops to recapture Tsingtao and doing that job pretty much themselves, just for national pride reasons alone. Um, the Russians would be after various islands and territories. Um, China would want the uh, would want to get China back, and would probably be Germany's main issue for taking Tsingtao. And uh, yeah, it would be interesting. Uh, so China, would Vancouver become more developed? Or was it literally already capable? Or was it already capable of being a hub? Vancouver was already capable of being a hub, but it would get a massive development probably. Um, Primark Free and Post War Singtel would have been an objective, not a wartime objective. Yeah, pretty much. Because, honestly, it's going to sound strange again, but if we go back to here, one of the points is often not put on this map is the fact that Wei Hai, well, Sing Tao is basically halfway between Wei Hai Wei and Hong Kong. So if you go up Hong Kong, Wei Hai Wei Hai, Wei Hai Wei is pretty much just a bit further north. And actually, if you see that bit, that curve bit around of China's coast, which is just about level with the southern Japanese islands, Sort of the bit like um, boom, and there's um, Sing Tao, Wei Hai Wei are in that area, and Wei Hai Wei is the better base. Mm, I'll let that one through, Re uh, Reginald. But again, little cousins, I don't need them. I I, I don't need them learning new le language. I don't. I, I like my limbs and neck attached. So. Third scenario, and I've, I've said I've left the fourth scenario because the fourth scenario I'm basically leaving for the long patrols question. 
Third scenario is East China Sea. So basically, the Japanese don't contest Hong Kong in this scenario. They, the Navy don't get involved. They leave it to the army. Basically, they don't, just don't turn up. And now you've got the East China Sea, which is going to the home islands and operating from the home islands and the support of the home islands as a protection. Because the East China Sea, why are the Allies going there? The Allies are doing the whole long game, and they turned, they've only built got to Hong Kong because now they want to link up with China. The, only, the reason they go to Hong Kong and they'd actually go and retake Hong Kong would be to link up with Chiang Kai-shek or the Republic of China forces and sort of start supplying them a lot of supplies so they could deal with the Japanese, they could uh, cause the Japanese trouble in the ground war in China. That's going to be especially of interest to the Americans, especially of interest to, as I said, certain allied partners. The British really aren't that bothered about it, but the British will do it. And they'll use an excuse to get Hong Kong back. And there again, hey, we've already captured Hong Kong. Hooray! Yeah, rule Britannia. We've got Hong Kong back. We don't need it for a war plan, but we've got Hong Kong back. And at that point, then they're going to be pushing the East China Sea. So at that point, you have a scenario of do you wait for the Japanese to be destroyed? Or do you go and attack the Japanese? Do you go and attack the Japanese? And and you are going to attack the Japanese fleet. Now, operate a uh, scenario four is of course the British, the Japanese fleet are sitting in harbour, and the British go and take out the Japanese fleet in harbour and sort of being fleet and being, Taranto style. Thanks to of course the fact that they are the ones with the torpedoes which have the tension wires on them. Remember, the aerial torpedoes. You have the problem of that pretty much everyone figures out is okay. Let's attach fins on the back to try and make them less likely to go uh, sort of do that rather than do that because of the heavy weight being at the end, this end and this area being less dense. But uh, the British went one step further and added tension wires on their swordfish, which meant that the, the, the tension wire helped them belly flop, which is why they could do the shallow water attacks in, in harbours. Reginald, language. No reason to call anyone any of those uh, any of those names on this chat. You've been warned twice now. I understand getting passionate, but Regina, no. I I I little cousins, elder cousins. Let's put it this way: I'm the only boy in forty cousins. I do not fight back. You do not hit women. They will massacre me. I might outmass them. But I will literally do nothing but try and run away and they know how to drive. So there is only so far I can run. So, you know, be kind to me. Stop trying. I, I know history is important. We get passionate and I get really, really passionate. But I like limbs attached. I like blood in my veins and my arteries. <laughs> oh... <laughs> Um, <laughs> Richards, to be fair, you have trouble with Nightbot, even on a good day, even when you're not swearing. <laughs> Nightbot doesn't like you. So you end up with the East China Sea as a possible argument, area of argument. So East China Sea, why? Well, if the Japanese don't decide to be a fleet of being, they decide to try and come out and try and break the blockade, because they need to. Then they're going to run into the British fleet, uh, British and the uh, British fleet in East China Sea. Now this will happen probably in late 1940. So again, British supplies will have worked up to this point. If this is this would be most likely would be after Hong Kong had been taken. So if British have taken Hong Kong, and they as have yay, it's probably Anglo-American force. As I said before, because of the reason before, neither side can afford the other one to humble Japan on their own. In which case, it's late 1940, you probably got either the British fleet or the Anglo-American fleet with all their allies in operating sort of out of the Hong Kong um, Manila area. And the Japanese probably seek to try and attack one fleet or the other first, do their own kind of Pearl Harbor operation. Again, the odds are they get heard coming. The odds are, especially with the cruiser forces the British will have out, and the submarines they'll have out, they'll get a warning that the Japanese are coming out. 
in uh, the British and American submarines are probably dealing with any Japanese merchant vessels. If you've got Manila as your forward operating base for submarines, and then Hong Kong as your forward operating bases for submarines, then your submarines are going to be having a field day with the Japanese in the East China Sea. They are literally going to, those submarines are going to have absolute heaven in terms of their attacks. So the Japanese come out, they, the forces that come out are not going to be the forces which attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941. They're going to be a lot weaker already because of the attrition of the blockade. They're going to be as many ships as they can put together, as many aircraft as they can put together. Do I think Tojo will become prime minister in a scenario? Possibly, but possibly Yonai becomes prime minister. Um, and if Yonai becomes prime minister, then I could see Japan trying to sue for peace because he's sensible and understands the scenario they'd be facing. But if Tojo, if the army have seized control, then Yonai might well be killed, and so might Yamamoto. In which case, who knows who's commanding the Japanese force by this point? Gurgland, I thought you had brew, I, I had brew in your veins. Probably, but, you know, I, I do try and claim it's blood, because that sounds healthier than Brian Brew. Southern Victor, coming from one of two, one of two brothers out of fifty females in a family, you will you be always nice or run. Yep. <laughs> Fifteenth century full plate for your own protection. I have asked uh, Drac for his supplies. Suppliers. Yep, Jacob. Um, Hi, right, Coach. World War I, Kriegsmarine tried to final death ride to reserve honor on surrender. Given their culture, the Igerians are more likely to try it. Uh, could this all end with an invasion of Japan? I don't think so. I think the Japanese would come out in this scenario, and I think it goes rather like I described for Hong Kong. I think you have, especially if you have the Anglo American combined fleet, I think you have. Um, the Japanese, as I've said, if they get the British on the, in the daylight with their aircraft, pro have the advantage. But I think with uh, the British won't let, allow them. They'll attack at night. Because, again, if you've got Cunningham out there as a fleet commander, Cunningham has no qualms. Cunningham was taught by Fisher. That's um, uh, John, not Jackie Fisher, I think, if I remember correctly, um, to be a night fighter. John Fisher had was the absolute archetypal British admiral obsessed with night fighting. He's one of the others lost in the 1930s. And he's a really, really smart officer. And he's the one who, along with Henderson and Cunningham and um, Black, oh, what's his name? Blackstone. Blackstone. Anyway, the, uh, the, the guy who actually mentioned at the beginning, let me go back to there and just find it so I make sure I get the right name. <laughs> yeah, um, Blackhouse um, are the ones who come up with British night fighting doctrine. And honestly, their plan is going to be not to fight fair. They're going to send the aircraft in at night. They're going to attack the Japanese at night and try and trip them that way with aircraft. Uh, they probably also be using submarines. You might well find a destroyer attacker coming in at night. Remember, tribal class destroyers at the front, rest of the destroyers at the back. The Japanese okay, again will be trying to uh, trying similar things, but. The difference is, combined with aircraft locating your enemy and tracking your enemy and launching the night nice attacks, um, it does rather facilitate your own destroyers and uh, destroyers finding the enemy in the dark. And the fact the British want to get closer, <coughs> well, yes, they don't have the long-range torpedoes, but it means that it doesn't matter if you're zigzagging as much because they're getting cl they're getting into knife fighting range. Um, at which point, your top-heavy destroyers could find themselves in trouble. Leave that to one side. The point is. Again, it results in attrition during the night and then an alpha strike during the morning at dawn. And the alpha strike comes from the American carriers. And the thing is, what? how does this all end? Well, this all ends, again, it's the British-style victory. Did the British want to invade Japan? Probably not. Would the British have bombarded Japan with their battleships trailed up and down the Japanese coast? Yes. And that would have probably been the British way of ensuring surrender. They'd have bombarded every single city from 
offshore with their with their battleships and launched their raids with their carriers and kept up the blockade and kept up the patrol, probably vessels like uh, flag class corvettes, etc., wandering around Japanese ports, stopping even fishing boats going out until Japan surrenders. I was asking, would the Allies have made an attempt to capture Taiwan? Um, potentially, or potentially they just ignored it and gone past it. It depends how much of a problem it turns out to be. If the Japanese turn out to be a problem in Taiwan, yes. But otherwise, they might just do it like they did during the Allen campaign and ignore it. I don't know. It must be very easy with something like this to fall afoul of what I did earlier. Um, you have to be very careful of timelines. And you have to think through things very carefully when you're doing a what-if scenario. Uh, it, it You have to think it all through very, very carefully and run simulations. And honestly, one of the things I've been sort of pointing out is my reading list for this week, and this is one of the reasons why, combined with my injuries, I had didn't produce the video on Tuesday, because I was reading all this, and that's just my reading list from the last couple of days. Um, and, um, yeah, I started off with one ankle damaged, and currently, I have ankle braces on both feet. But, yeah, that's a, that's something to not explain on YouTube videos, how that happened. Uh, let's put it this way. Hypothetically, hypothetically, uh, yeah, life happens. Hello, Stafford. Um, Yonai, and if you look, if you're interested in Yonai, uh, Primark 3509, if you look up my Axis CNC series on this channel, you'll find uh, Yonai is listed as one, is one of the Commander-in-Chiefs of the Japanese Navy who I talk about. Um, if we go back, I actually have him listed at the beginning because he's Defence Minister at this point. Well, Navy Minister at this point. Um, so I can give you his full details. It's Mitsumasa Yonai. And he is the guy who sponsors Yamato, Yamamoto, and is probably one of the best admirals in the Japanese Navy, uh, if not the best. And he's he's one of the most trusted. He is definitely one of the uh, one of the untold, really good Japanese admirals. And we are very lucky that he wasn't actually used during the war because he was considered not to be. Um, uh, how do I put this? Pro, uh, pro enough fighting the Allies because he thought it was stupid and advised against it. He'd advised very strongly both him and Yamamoto against signing the uh, the pact with the Japan uh, with the Germans and the Italians because he felt it was pointless. Sigma, like question ring. The Alex, the problem with this plan, as I see it, is the clash between Allied senior and commanders. Only King does not like us, and there is a chance he would refuse to work closely with the RN. Uh, yes, but the trouble is he there's also a chance he refuses to work close with the RN in World War II, but he ends up having to work close with the RN because he has to. And Ernie Kinning is not the senior commander in the Pacific. Ernie King, uh, the commander in the Pacific, uh, CNC Pacific Fleet at this point, in, 19, in January 1939, is uh, Edward C. Kawafus. And he'll be replaced by James Richardson in June 1939. But at the moment, it's Kawafus, uh, who, if you look up, is actually quite an interesting officer. He's president of the United States Naval War College from 1934 to 1936 and 1939 to 1942. He's one of the smartest men the U.S. Navy's ever had and is considered one of the... Um, uh, best officers they ever had. He's also the guy who chain, who trains Ching Li. So he was a member of the Court of Inquiry into the Pearl Harbor attack and was the one who, how do I put this, was most forthright against what some of the personalities did there. 
and he's a really, really useful person. And I think it, Roosevelt would still have, of course, Roosevelt's in charge and Roosevelt's president. So Roosevelt gets the final say, not King. Honey, what are you injured? Well, I injured one ankle one day and I managed to injure the next ankle the next day. Uh... Michael, if things are that desperate for Japanese, they wouldn't kamikaze, then wouldn't kamikaze? Uh, kamikaze might try and make an appearance, but that would require a lot more aircraft than they had. And remember, that's a lot longer war scenario. And whilst it might make an appearance at that point, the ally, is it going to be able to be produced quickly enough? And are they going to be, opera, are they going to be starting early enough to start it? Plus, again, armoured carriers. I'm currently walking with the aid of a stick because I managed to bash up my feet that much. And I've decided I'm on cheat days permanently until I feel better. Mm. Probably until, probably about another week, Michael Kitch on the Jimmy. Right, thank you, found him. Yeah, it will get better, it will be fine. Not dog related. Well, the first one was sort of dog related because I was walking the dog when it happened. It was my granddad's. That's a chestnut one. There is a debate as to whether he made it to the standard NHS hospital pattern or whether he got it from the NHS. Um, half my family think he made it to the NHS pattern after looking and getting a copy of the NHS pattern because it doesn't quite fit the NHS pattern, and the other half just think he got a he got a he got a slightly special one off the NHS. But um, I do know it's slightly thicker. And um, slightly di slightly different curve than the NHS pattern, so it does seem to be slightly different than the standard pattern. That looks homemade to modify spec. Possibly, potentially. Potentially. He did like to work with chestnut. But it's also quite possible that he knew someone who made the NHS, uh, made the NHS sticks and they just helped him. But, uh, yeah. Hmm. Oh yeah, I'm still doing, I'm still planning and that's why I got the things I did. And actually, I will say this. Um, if you're like me and you've done stupid things in your youth and you have managed to hurt your ankles so that they are, if they're already damaged, are already in a pro are susceptible to um, getting occasional injuries because they're already damaged because you've done things. Oh. These are quite useful. I found them they're from Waspo, and they are pretty darn good. I got a pack of a pack of two for about six quid, I think it was, and um, so they do both feet, basically, and yeah, they work very well. Thank you very much. In terms of protecting my feet, and I'm going to probably get some more. So that I can 
always guarantee my, when I go to the gym, stop myself re-injuring myself, especially while I'm building them up, I can wear, I carry on wearing them. What are they? Uh, they're my ankle braces. Um, they're ankle braces. Um, I won't be rude and show my feet on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Um, youthful ignorance, youthful exuberance. Uh, yeah, I knew the damage I was doing when I was doing it, but I enjoyed what I was doing, and so I did it. Um, I knew exactly what I was doing to myself. I still did it. So, yeah, youthful exuberance and stupidity. So King must wave ball. He could still wave his gun in meetings, right? Yes, he could still wave his gun in meetings, but in nicest way, the British might send Montbatten to still wave his gun in meetings, and frankly, that's more scary, because let's be honest, he actually fires at things. No, no one is no one is offering I am not doing foot picks. It's bad enough that I actually do have an account on OnlyFans. I do. I have an account to why I, I got it to wind up an ex-girlfriend of my mum, because they said, "Oh, if you got Patreon, oh, what's next?" OnlyFans went, "Oh yes, actually, I've set one up." And I went, "Oh no, you haven't." So of course I had to make sure I actually had one set up so I could prove it, and so I do have an OnlyFans account. But lead that to one side. Mm -hmm. What do you enjoy doing so much? Um, jumping in and out of helicopters. It's not good for your legs, and it's not, it's not good for your knees, your ankles, or your legs in any way, shape, or form. Oh, and rugby. Both of them, not, not good for anything. You do. Uh, I, I, no, no, I'm not doing my feet. Okay. <laughs> 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 you will send no, I'm not sending a link. <laughs> there is nothing on that. <laughs> there is actually there is a picture of a tribal class destroyer. That is all that's on there is a picture of a tribal class destroyer. But lead up to one side. <laughs> Nine So by 1942, the Iron U.S. and have severe fission Avenger. Yes. By 1942, under this scenario, Japan, the probably war is over with Japan or ending. Um, the R British and the Americans have 2,000 horsepower engines in service. They have a whole lot more carriers in service and a whole lot more ships. Their industry and everything is operating at high end. And at that point, you have to consider the amount of radar and technology developments taking place. Chain home will be massively upgraded. Um, yeah. And I thought I'd remind everyone, of course, Bill Trumps is back. We've got, uh, this week, we had uh, Richard Dunley. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of story about Richard Dunley. He's really smart. He's really good. And he's you know, he works at Ca in Canberra and Australia. And uh, Jamie thought, of armoured carriers, thought, brilliant. I've got an Australian. This week, Drac's not here. It's going to be two Aussies versus the Brit. We'll win. I will win. I will, I will outnumber him. Richard gets on the chat, and I go, Hi, Richard, how are you doing? And Jamie's going, what, 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 what? Oh, we did our PhDs together. <laughs> so, yes, uh, poor Jamie had to deal with two of Andrew Lambert's former PhD students. <laughs> it was fun. No, no, no. What would happen if the Dutch, France, UK, and US are joining the Sino-Japanese War in 1907 on the China side? Um, if they join the war, and Japan in 1937, Japan is really not ready. If we go back to the thing earlier, in terms of naval aviation, Japan in 1937... Uh, if we go back in, in 1937, this one... Um, Sawyer is only commissioned in December 1937. 
Hiryu is in until July 1939, so there's no chance of Hiryu being available. So we go into here, it just gets really, really bad for the Japanese. It re goes really, really bad for the Japanese. The Japanese are not ready for war in 1937 against the Americans and the Brits. So by 1942, there are any of spear fishermen. I'll answer that one. Uh, each of the done. Uh, not Mount Bandon meetings. Those throws for high crete and everyone's drinks. Oh, good lord. Give me yeah. Although you don't really need high crete in this scenario. <laughs> oh. Polish approved mean. Yes, it was. They used to be. A, I'm not sure why we stopped, but we used to receive all these memes based on Bilge Pumps videos, uh, Bil uh, Bilge Pumps uh, podcasts, and I used to enjoy putting them. They used to be a. There's a whole section on my on the Discord channel which has these memes posted in them. People used to add them, and I used to occasionally nick them and put them into my slides. And then for some reason, people stopped doing it. I'm not sure why, but it used to be a lot of fun. And it used to give us all a lot of love. We'd share them all. I'd share the latest ones with um, Jamie and Drac before, when we were about to record a bilge pumps, and we just see all the memes before we started, and it would start us off. C. Clark. So, if Germany is part of the 3942 alliance, how much assistance does the Kriegsmarine get off the USN and RM in terms of naval tech? Um, that's an interesting question. Probably enough to be useful. But not enough. Let's put it this way: the Germans aren't going to be need to be given the same amount of t the the a mass amount of the same amount of tech they probably share with each other. Whereas the they're probably given enough tech to be useful. They might be given. It, it might be a case of actually set them up the French and you get the French to share tech with them. That's probably more like it. Let's see Mitchell. Play cricket, rugby, and skiing. First knee, I'll put 11. Damage back, back in car in the 40s. Then take up Kyoto in 50s. Then goof for you. But yeah, that, that's good for your body. How, how do you think this would impact the future invasion of Poland? It might delay it, because again, the Polish might try and get involved in the alliance. And the, if the Soviets are involved, and the, Pol the Poles are involved, and the Germans are involved, then it could well delay it till about 1942. In which case, the Poles might well have their own defences and things in a far stronger state than they were in 1939. It could give them more time. It would probably give them three to four years. I too. You wonder. I, I, you know. I wonder if the Dutch Navy would manage to get some 147s built in time. Potentially, potentially they do. At least one. Uh, Sidra ninety. How much of a threat does Japan pose in this scenario to the Philippines? They don't have the troops, resources, or position forces position. Plus, they don't get the early annihilation of the fleet and Pearl Harbor and the damages that causes in timeline to be able to get the forces to the Philippines. They could still potentially attack the Philippines, but by the time they do, the Philippines will be actually alert and armed, and there is no chance they they don't get caught in uh, caught by surprise, and hopefully by that point MacArthur doesn't. Well, either the commanders know what they're doing anyway, and so I can operate, or MacArthur doesn't go and hide off in his room. <clears throat> particularly if they send ground force to take Singtao, yes, the Germans will be particularly in, 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 involved if they're sending their prime their ground forces to send Singtao. That could also that also probably protects quite a lot of other people as well. Have you watched Laser Pig yet? Not yet. So Tom, you did ask them to stop a while back. All you need to do is ask us so that's some sure it means all return. Did I ask them to stop? When did I ask them to stop? I can't remember asking them to stop. 
Was there a reason I asked him to stop? I think I seem to remember saying something like, can you not, can you make sure you post them in the meme channel? I didn't think I asked him to stop. I'm not sure. Maybe I did. I, I hope I didn't. Thank you, Jack Ray. Uh, Andrew Crow, what? No Pie Creek? Surely you, uh, no, no, no Pie Creek necessary. Uh, given the only fans revelation I can I caramba. Um actually on if the Germans are involved in the war, then the Americans and British are gonna find a way to do a health inspection of their ships. Alliance of convenience before the next war. Yeah, there there will be so much inspections going on. Our own is always planning for the next war. Yes, for done we are. Going back to the prior clip, a late, Euro a late European war means Bismarck meeting battle-proven Prince of Wales and Temeraire and the Denmark Strait. Yeah, it, it, in the nicest way, it, it, it does not go well for the Germans, any kind of later war, because A, the British will have more carriers, B, you honestly probably have the Lion class entering service. And also remember, this might be a Lion class, bill, uh, Lion class and also... Whatever the British, if it is delayed enough, it might be whatever comes after the British have found the Yamamoto and Mashashi and looked over them and gone, Woo! Someone made 18-inch guns work as well. Okay. And of course the treaty system's broken down. Oh, yeah. Ooh, we fancy. We want a big gun. Say, yes, because we were in the process of modernization in 42, we were to have tanks on par with Panzer IV and modern fighters and semi-auto rifles for the army. And the Poles who have equipment equivalent capability to the Germans are not the po are not Poles I want to fight if I'm the Germans. Ouch, Richards, that sounds painful. You broke your back in a, having a seizure in 2013. Ouch. So what, uh, like, sorry, so what island ships would be retired after this war? Probably most of the First World War generation. Um, most of the First World War generation. Thank you, Leslie. I have watched various episodes on Poland arming up and various things on Poland arming up, but also... I have a few friends who are, well, friends slash former students who were involved in the Polish arming up and I get some very interesting feedback from them. Right, right. I just uh, got a bit out of a business call where I was saying a lot of I don't know. I had to relieve the stress somehow. With you, Jack, don't take this the wrong way, everyone else listening, but having had a few discussions with Jack, I'm fairly sure if you don't know, that's because the question they were asking was so left field that frankly no one would know without going and doing some thorough research into very, very weird areas of his uh, weird areas of technology. Or alternatively, you were saying, I don't know, because it was just so bad and you couldn't say to them, you're being, a you're being an idiot. The RN is planning, always planning. The RN's always planning for the next war. The Treasury is always trying to. Uh, the Treasury is always trying to lose the next war. Melanie sixty forty. In that case, of why do the RN played for free and only got two carriers? So you've got RN dusting off the N three plans. And they're, they're certainly having some fun. <laughs> oh. Yeah, Hood will be uh, basically all the World War One generation, including Hood, will have gone. Uh, Nelson Rodney will probably survive for a bit, but not that long. It, they'll be replaced by the next generation that comes after the Lions. Echevedon realizes that if this war happens, then with South the amateur specs being found, we get the South Dakota's Lee in South Dakota, uh, South Dakota's Lee in a South Dakota searching for German battleships. 
Yeah, you get you get you probably get possibly get Xing Li partnering up with uh, Xing Li partnering up with um, the new HMS Warspite built after Warspite's retired, um, and going hunting for German battleships. Just think about that lovely scenario. Sigil 90, do you think an effort to build up war for a navy to fight this war and effort would detract from later war against U-boats? Probably not, because I do think the vessels like the... Uh, well, A, there'd be a lot of construction, upgrading of construction facilities to build turbines, so they'll be able to build more turbines, but they'd also be building... They would still be ordering sloops, because they all start ordering the, the sloops and corvettes and the Hunt-class escort destroyers in 1938. They start off that program. So they'd probably still be building those, so you probably end up getting a huge stockpile of those being built before war begins. So therefore, you'd probably have the convoy force available for a war before a war actually happens in Europe. Or at least far more of it. No, and not... Uh, I haven't seen Purin yet, and no, I haven't invited him, therefore, to build Trumps. I'd like to see them before I invite them. Nice ignorance. So, Diaz, Queen Elizabeth Renown's not sure about Hood, given it seems that she was intended to go until 1954. Yeah, but honestly, if, you, if you're building a massive amount of fleet, why would you keep Hood going rather than get rid of her? <coughs> She'll be a repl she'd probably be the last to be replaced of that batch, but it'd probably go Ars, Queen Elizabeth Renown's, and then Hood gone. You've been airlifted because you stopped breathing. That's... Yeah. Primate free run. Turn the scenario to three or four... Uh, or, uh, turn the scenario three to four year war. Poland then would have... What would happen in, 1940, uh, in like 1944? If it was Germany or Saar invading, could we see an Anglo-French versus Germany or Soviet Union, European Union? Uh, you could see something very interesting. You'd probably also see the Americans get involved in that scenario. It's going to sound strange. The Americans, if the Americans get involved in this one and do well and come out of it, they come out with a strong alliance with Britain and France, etc. And that could change your relationship to the extent that if Germany then decided to invade Poland and cause trouble, America might actually join the League of, Na League of Nations or something like that. In which case, America could end up involved. In 1999, Yamato Mushashi are hulls with some equipment on I do wonder if Japan, while losing, breaks up the hulls and hides all the elements. Purely on spike. Uh, potentially, but probably not. Uh, Cold War Chemical. Would it be a good idea to make a limbo squid launcher with a one kill ton warhead for 1950 SW? Um, I think that's... Oh... I think that's what we called the Ikara, and that's what the Ikara was really for. <clears throat> that's the idea behind that, I think, in memory. Although it was never ma 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 mated with the British um, nuclear warhead, which it could have been. How, uh, how would this war change the general of naval warfare? Um, you probably would have the carrier coming to the fore, but you might not have the clear-cut carrier dominant over battleship scenarios, so you probably still have battleships hanging around for, well, at least a new generation of battleships being constructed. And especially if you don't have it, it'd probably be a European, then a European war, and then you, have, you could well have battleships dang, hanging on for at least not, until about 1960s. Uh, also, the other interesting thing is the British and the Americans could invest in a lot in jet technology. So you could have jets coming in to service a lot earlier. So you got, uh, Steve Clark, if the RN scraps the 15 inch World War 1 ships, did the guns get reused to build more Vanguard class? Potentially, potentially not. Depends on how the Lion class goes. I'd I'd very much enjoy it, Sejan. I like I like to. I'm very interested in Russian Ukrainian tanks at the moment. Um. Now, if we're suddenly in this war, it would mean the treaties are dead. Do cruisers get built to natural size? Potentially, 
potentially they need to be built bigger because of operating in the Pacific. I too, you know, with Britain in a war for a better financial state and several more battle honors on about could war spike find itself preserved as a museum ship? Mm, oh, that's an interesting question. That is an interesting question. I'd say probably not. But I'm not 100% certain. They might preserve a turret or something like that of hers. They might keep a turret of hers. Rather than whole ship. Pramak, would this maybe actually significantly deter Polish invasion, or would the German Soviet decide to redraw? Europe be too strong. You have to remember the German desire to withdraw Europe is for living from and money from it. The Soviet Union desire to, the Soviet Union, the Soviet and Russian desire to withdraw Europe is to capture defensible borders. Because Russia doesn't have them. And so both the, the war won't change either of those scenarios. But it could provide a lot of diversions. So it could provide the Polish with time. I could see the carrier perhaps taking over quite a lot of battle cruiser role. But I could also see a sort of battle cruiser, large heavy cruiser developing as the primary escort for the carriers, as the big escort for the carriers. Lucas Junch. Yeah. Andreas, without the World War Two main campaign, would there be a movement to preserve war spite rather than say the mighty hood? Um the thing is, it depends how long they last. You see if the hood ends up lasting and uh, let's put it this way, the hood if she if she's around for the beginning of the next war and she lasts through that she then could get preserved. If War Spite managed to last through this war, and let's say is in reserve because she's been upgraded, so she's still around, and then the next war kicks off in 1944, and she hasn't been got rid of completely yet, War Spite could hang around through that war. And then she'll have been through the Anglo, ja the Great World War against Japan, the w First World War, and the world European War, then they could get preserved. So it's going to be very much a case of in what under what timeline do they get do they get scrapped and what do they do in those timelines? Ladies and gentlemen, you mean the anti battle cruiser cruiser? Yeah, pretty much. Right then, I need to upgrade that. I need to I, that update this. I haven't updated this this week. I lost the day. Pretty much. Anyway, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I'm going to take final questions now because I've run out of liquid. And so my voice is starting to go because I've been talking all day. Everyone had given up on the treaties in 1939. The moment war breaks out, the treaties are gone. There might be a post war push to try for an updated treaty system, but before a war in Europe breaks out, it's unlikely to have any impact. Yes, Safford, but would it be actually be called a battle cruiser, or would it be called a large cruiser, or a command cruiser, or something else? Um, actually, Russia, wouldn't the Soviets attack Europe if the Germans had beat them up? Remember, the Soviets could well be involved in attacking in Japan at this point, so they could well be taken up in the war as well, and trying to retake China, take over large areas of China. So, um, yeah, they'll probably be busy with that. But yes, but all uh, yes, they will do. But also, you have to remember the Soviets have attacked Poland several times at this point, and Finland, in the nineteen twenties and thirties, and they've lost every single time. So, 
Whilst, yeah, they, they, they theoretically have it. It's one of the arguments, actually, for reasons the Poles were so were not really in a good place to fight the Germans. It was because they'd been fighting the Soviets so often that their, all their forces in their positions were actually orientated around, primarily around fighting the Soviets and the Germans. Take care, take care, CJ90. Thank you, Sunfit. Thank you, Gogolanda. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Ames Morrison. Uh, thank you, Mitras Verdun. Thank you, uh, Bill Bolton. Thank you, I too. If I had to choose between a four a turreted, uh, four turreted Des Moines or upgrade Alaska, I would want the Des Moines Plus. Mm, cool. Carlos, thank you. Uh, Steve Clark, thank you. So, do we see the eight-inch autoloader escorts potentially, or potentially the nine-point-two-inch autoloader escorts? Mm-hmm. That's about the largest you can make up to an autoloader. Uh, thank you, Michael Cox. Thank you, Stafford. Thank you, Michael Hooch. Thank you, Bishon. Thank you, Lucas Shimps. Giving each carrier to Alaska light cruiser would deter a battle cruiser, I guess. Yeah, it would. Um, our Japan sets one off to surrender. It depends. If Yontai becomes Prime Minister, yeah, Yontai becomes Prime Minister, maybe. If not, um, they will surrender, but it will be very painful by the time they do. Uh, Primark 359, this conflict might push the Soviet to invest more in, in Navy, which would be an interesting battle flight. Yes, yeah, Stalin might get his battle cruisers. Um, a 20,000 ton supercruiser, yes, David Golding, that would be pretty much on the money for a, for a carrier escort. Um, Thanks, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jack Ray. Thank you, everyone, for keep, uh, for chatting away. And as I said in my post, uh, designing ships will come out tomorrow. I'm going to re-record it tomorrow morning because I don't like the version, and then, honestly, I wasn't that well. Um, better now, though, so all sorted and then catching up. And, uh, yeah, next week is Seizing Control, the Close Blockade. And then it's Marine Diesels on the 21st of February. And on 20th of February, it's Steam Rates. The Wooden Wall gets here, gets hisses and huffs. Yeah, for, for, for some dual purpose 9.2 inch. Goodness gracious me. That, if it's designed by the British who like, seven, who like 8 inch guns that go up 70 degrees, never can, never, never count that out. Thank you, Tobias Geoffrey. So, you, caught the, you, you caught the end of the stream. And thank you, Deathful Crows, and thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it, and thank you. I hope you had fun. Going land, Stalin could get his battle cruiser and then fire everybody who knows how to sail or swim or use guns. He had already fired them mostly in 1937. That's been fine. Anyway, take care, everyone. Thank you for watching, and hope you enjoyed. Toodles. Toodles, Melanie. And thank you, of course, to Madmin, Stafford, Dan, Jack, Melanie, who all did a wonderful job this evening. Thank you very much, everyone, and hope you had a nice evening. Take care, and thank you. <laughs>